Right, welcome to the uh, workshop C sharp scripting and plugin development for uh, Grasshopper. So um, this is uh, the third year that uh, we are doing this workshop as part of the iTech Master program. Uh, this year um, we live stream it, as uh, you know. So um, just a little bit. So uh, the the iTech is uh, the name of the master program in uh, integrative uh, technology. Um, here we um, have students from all around the world, uh, mostly architects and engineers, but we also have uh, biologists working together to um, study uh, robotic um, technology, how to use new technology to uh, design and uh, fabricate and build. So uh, the program is um, run by the uh, Institute for Computational Design, ICDs, where I work at, and in collaboration with uh, the ITKE, the Institute for Structural, uh, for, for Building Structural and uh, Structural Design. So um, we are live stream now uh, from uh, the University of Stuttgart. Uh, so here in the room with me um, are the iTech students. Um, so uh, the workshop gonna be um, run and live stream uh, for three days today, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. We start at 9.30. Uh, and then we break for lunch at uh, 1 p.m. Um, ge uh, in German time. Then we will continue at uh, 2.30 until 6, okay? Um, so um, to help me run this workshop, uh, we have uh, Benjamin, uh, who is sitting right next to me, and uh, Dong Yu. Uh, they will be going around and help the people who are physically in this room, and they will also um, answer, on, uh, answer to the comments on the, the live stream. Okay, and there will be one more uh, person, one of our own iTech Master students might be joining in uh, later on the uh, live stream comment section. Okay. So, uh, I mean, you guys feel free to like uh, have a casual conversation. I, uh, this is like a live, live stream, but it's not really uh, <laughs> a super formal event, so don't worry about staying absolutely uh, silent or quiet, okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think we can uh, get started now. So uh, the aim of this uh, workshop, obviously, um, we want to uh, teach you the basic of the C-sharp programming language. Uh, we want to help you gain better understanding of object-oriented uh, programming, which is like the, um, the, the universal um, kind of programming um, paradigm in many modern programming languages uh, these days. I want to help you go beyond the uh, visual scripting in Grasshopper using the C-sharp script components. Um, we want to help you become even more familiar with Rhino Common Library. Some of you have never used Rhino Common Library before, but like, most of you who are in the iTech programs already um, use the Rhino Common Library um, to some extent. So this workshop will help you uh, even get into more details. Uh, it will generally improve your uh, programming skills, and these skills will apply to not just C-sharp, but pretty much any uh, modern programming language and um, uh, the, um, the way to uh, do design thinking, uh, programmatic uh, thinking for uh, design. Um, one big thing of this workshop is to show you how to use this tool called Visual Studio. This is like a professional software development tool from Microsoft that we will use to write uh, plugins for uh, for Grasshopper, uh, and of course we're gonna learn to create a plugin for Grasshopper. So, all right. So the um, general program for the three days are as follows. So in the first day we um, have a brief introduction to the C sharp language. Um, and then we're gonna get start with the C sharp script component in Grasshopper. So all of the code and the script that we're gonna type and create in the first day will be inside Grasshopper, inside the C-sharp script component inside Grasshopper. Then we're gonna um, um, start to uh, use C-sharp to access the Rhino Common Library. So this is like a library where you use a programming language like C-sharp to interact with uh, Rhino, uh, with, with Rhino uh, modeling environment. And then we're gonna make some brief introduction to object-oriented uh, programming. Uh, Object-oriented programming is like a big topic in itself that usually take a whole semester at the university to finish. So here we, there's no way we can cover every single aspect in like uh, one or two days. Uh, this is like just give you a pre-introduction so you can probably understand the Rhino Commons uh, kind of framework 
And when you read the documentation yourself, you kind of understand what the keywords, what the concepts in the documentation means, and you can go on uh, on yourself. All right. And so on Wednesday, which is the second day of the workshop, we're going to jump right into uh, Visual Studio. So it's important that if you want to follow this workshop, be on time on the second day because we will start with Visual Studio right away. And if you kind of fall in behind, it's uh, kind of difficult to catch up based on my teaching experience from the previous year. Then we're going to start to touch on the Grasshopper API library. So the Rhino Common Library is the library that we use to interact with the main Rhino software, while the Grasshopper API is the API that built on top of the Rhino Common that we can use to interact with Grasshopper. So we're going to use that in together, uh, together with a Rhino Common library to write a plugins or custom components for Grasshopper. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to dive uh, deeper into object-oriented programming and the Rhino Common Library. And then, as like a big exercise to demonstrate all of the concepts and the points that uh, we learned uh, during the first and the second day, uh, we're going to do this big exercise called, um, known as the, flock, uh, the flocking simulations, and we're going to implement this uh, simulation as a Grasshopper plugin. Okay. Uh, on the day three, we're gonna touch on more advanced topic, uh, um, such as computational complexity. So it will tell you uh, why algorithm run fast, uh, why some algorithm run slow. Uh, what can we do to improve it? Uh, how can we uh, make the algorithm uh, use less memory in general? Again, this is a big topic in itself. Uh, the goal here is just to show you that it's a very relevant uh, thing to keep in mind when you program. It's not meant to give you like a complete understanding of this um, pretty advanced topic. Uh, then we're going to see how we can optimize the flocking simulation that we did in the second day with uh, this special algorithm uh, known as spatial data structure. Um, then we will learn how to use external libraries. So let's say we you have a, a, a library that uh, is available uh, externally, um, external to Grasshopper or, or C Sharp uh, or, or, or Rhino in common, and you want to use this library inside your script inside Grasshopper. Um, this will show you how to do that. And we we're going to use uh, Kangaroo as uh, an example. And then you're going to learn how to essentially package the code that you write as your own library, so you can share it with other people. <coughs> All right, and the final topic, uh, which is like the new topic that I add, that we add to this year, is basically you learned the interaction between uh, the .NET code or the, the C Sharp code and the R and Python. So um, in, in Grasshopper, Python is um, probably uh, the most popular scripting language in Grasshopper by now. Uh, many students who uh, start scripting. Uh, who start to learn scripting, they start with Python at first. So uh, now we're going to learn uh, the C-sharp language. And I think it's nice to demonstrate the interaction between these two languages. So you write some code in C-sharp that can run very fast, but then you be, will be able to access this code inside the Python language. So you get the best of both worlds. So namely, you, you get the high performance of the C-sharp language and also the simplicity uh, of the Python language. Okay. So uh, why uh, C Sharp in, uh, gen in general? So um, C Sharp is an um, increasingly uh, popular language. It's very well documented, and it has a big community. Um, it is still evolving language, which means that every year, um, the uh, development team of this language, AKA Microsoft, they're still adding more features to it. In fact, um, at this year already, the C Sharp component in uh, Grasshopper is already a little bit old, and there's many new features that the C Sharp component has not really supported yet. Uh, it is a .NET language, uh, so C Sharp is .NET language. .NET is like um, it's, it's almost has nothing to do with Internet. Um, they call it .NET, but it uh, almost has nothing to do with the Internet itself. It's just uh, a name of um, of a group of um, family of languages that Microsoft devised. And many of these languages, like C Sharp or uh, Visual Basic, they, they share the same common like um, underlying uh, low-level um, architecture. So which means that um, when you write a program in one of the languages, you should be able to communicate with a program in a different language uh, easily. And as you can see uh, later, this is the reason why um, 
the Python script that we use in Grasshopper will be able to interact with the C-sharp code that we're going to write because the, the Python script that is used in Grasshopper is also based on the .NET uh, language. In fact, the, the, the Python, uh, the version of the Python script that we're using uh, that um, that he used in Grasshopper was actually written in C sharp, and it may sound weird to say that a language is written in another language, but we, we're gonna um, talk more about that on uh, the final day of the workshop. Okay, so um, the Rhino Common Library is uh, based on a .NET language, so naturally that's why we need to um, use a .NET language to uh, access the Rhino Common Library. All right. Uh, many other uh, APIs, and many other libraries are also based on .NET. Uh, most of these libraries are on the Windows side. Um, so many uh, of the modern software these days, um, like uh, Revit, um, AutoCAD, or uh, um, even FreeS Max or Maya, now they start to support uh, the .NET language. Uh, traditionally, when you want to write plugin or want to, if you want to interact with these uh, software, you need to use uh, C++. Or some low, or some lower le uh, level programming language, which is very hard to use. But now most of the software they they, they start to uh, integrate uh, the .NET into the library, making it easier for you to interact with the software programmatically. Uh, also on the Windows side, uh, C sharp uh, can be used to uh, design and program graphical user interface. But uh, we're not going to cover the topics in this uh, workshop, though. Uh, and finally, uh, within the context of Grasshopper and Rhino, uh, C Sharp provide very uh, fast uh, executions uh, of the code, especially when compared to Python. Okay, so so um, next thing I want to show you is a little bit of a benchmark demo between uh, the four choice of um, scripting or programming in the Grasshopper. So first, we use Visual Scripting itself. Uh, the second is the Python. Uh, the third one is uh, the VB uh, language or the Visual Basic .NET language, and finally uh, C Sharp. Okay, so let me uh, switch to Rhino. All right, so so here is a simple benchmark where I have uh, five script components. Uh, so the first one is Python. Uh, the second was is uh, exactly the same um, script, but was written in a VB language. Um, the third one is, is uh, written in the C sharp language. The final two one uh, was written in VB and C sharp, but compiled as a plugin. Okay, so let me turn this on. So as you notice, when I uh, enable this component, there will be a little pause. Okay, Grasshopper will pause a little bit, and I, I will explain why there is that little pause. Okay, all right. So uh, for those of you who already know a little bit of Python, uh, this is a simple script that has a for loop that runs for for a very large number of times, uh, and that large number is basically uh, ten million. So just a simple loop that add 1.0 to a variable ten million times. Okay, and then we measure how long this for loop takes to execute. Okay, so we measure the time, and then we print it out. Okay, uh, same with the other component. This this one is exactly the same for loop, but it's written in the VB language. Okay, if you're not uh, familiar with this language, then uh, don't worry. Uh, okay, this is C sharp. Okay, uh, these uh, there's no source code because uh, these the source code was actually written in Visual Studio, and then we compile it and we build it into. Uh, a, a custom Grasshopper component, and then we install it as a plugin. Okay, so as you can see here, um, this component actually was installed as a plugin that appear right here. Um, please excuse my icon design skill, uh, obviously. <laughs> all right, so let me run all of these five components again. Remember, they do exactly the same thing. They run the for loop for 10 um, million times. So I'm going to recompute everything again, and then we're going to see the time. So Grasshopper freeze a little bit because it takes some time. OK, so these are the time measure in milliseconds. So Python takes almost five full seconds to finish. Uh, VB script takes only 28 milliseconds, C sharp 27. OK, and uh, the plugin version of VB and C sharp take like only eight milliseconds. So the time difference between Python's and the uh, plugin version uh, is almost like 500 times, as you can see. And this is like 
only a simple for loop, and you already see a pretty um, dramatic difference. Okay, so. Uh, that was the reason why when we recompute, um, basically, Grasshopper froze for almost five seconds. That was mostly because of the Python component. Okay, so uh, we, I have another, um, so I have some other uh, benchmark here. So, um, now, uh, this time is the same thing, uh, the same big loop that runs for a smaller number of time, only 100,000 times now. But inside the loop, uh, we do something more complicated than just a simple addition. So we actually have a square root operator, uh, a cosine operator, and a sine operator. These are pretty uh, uh, computationally costly operator. Okay. All right. Now same for the VB and the C# uh, script component. Okay. And now we run again, and then you're gonna see there's also a significant uh, difference between the computation time. Even though this time um, the difference is less less dramatic. Um, because generally, uh, uh, this time, uh, the bottleneck is because of the square root, the cos and the side, and these functions came from the math library, and the math library is generally quite optimized already, so uh, that's why the time difference between Python and um, C-sharp and VB is not that big. Okay, uh, This time, there's almost no, visual, uh, there's almost no significant uh, difference between the script component and the plugin component of both C-sharp and VB. The reason is, again, both C-sharp and VB call into the same math library, to do the cosine, the square root, and the side operator. And it doesn't matter whether it is called from a script component or from the plugin, it's still called from the same library, so the same code is run. That's why the time, the execution time, is uh, very similar. Okay. So let me close this and then we go to another benchmark. All right, so those are just uh, benchmark uh, with numbers only, uh, no geometry. Now, this one, again, I open the script and uh, you see a little bit of a, a pause here. So just hang on a second. Okay, my crossover disappeared. I need to take it back. Okay. So now again, um, this benchmark we have, we basically again have a for loop, a nested for loop that runs 400 by 400 times. It's time we just create a point on the screen. Okay. Um, this Python uh, script used the Rhino script uh, syntax library to create points. Uh, the C sharp and the uh, VB script use uh, the Rhino comma libraries to create points on the screen. Okay. And these are the time. Uh, for execution, again, a uh, pretty um, significant difference, about uh, 200 times, okay? So that is why when I open it, you might notice there are a little uh, long pause. So uh, even though the pause was actually much longer than uh, 800 milliseconds, the reason is because even though the for loop takes only 800 milliseconds to finish, the actual output of geometry on a canvas uh, take extra time, and extra time is actually way more significant than the for loop itself. So if I open the profiler, which basically tell me how much t the total time each component runs, see, the Python take almost 10 seconds to output the, uh, these points. Why the, 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 uh, the VB script and the C sharp script take only one second? Okay, and the plugin version is even faster, only 44 milliseconds. So again, like a uh, really big contrast here. All right, so this um, time difference is uh, especially important when you want to implement some script that is execute again and again. So for those of you who already know Grasshopper, you might notice that you can execute the script again and again using a timer. So imagine each, uh, so when you want to execute a script or um, a definition using a timer, you want it to be executed as fast, uh, generally as fast as possible, okay? Um, so when you want to wait 10 seconds before the next execution t uh, take in, um, you won't see a nice animation or real-time update on the screen. So here I have another uh, benchmark, which basically we kind of um, have a, a, um, a circular wave uh, visualizer. Okay, uh, this wave will be animated and it will move uh, each one step at 
a time. So here, uh, first we have a poor grasshopper uh, version. So this wave now is built entirely for, by the uh, standard grasshopper uh, components uh, with a timer. Okay. So whenever I rerun the script, so if I press recompute or if I press F5, um, the uh, time counter will advance by uh, like one, and then that time counter will be used to update the position of the wave, okay? So if I press and hold F5 now, you can see that the wave being updated. And in fact, it's so slow that you can see its individual iterations uh, on the screen, okay? All right, now let me disable this. Now I have, we can recreate this thing using uh, Python. Okay. Uh, now again, if I press F5, it, okay, so it probably slightly faster than the visual scripting uh, uh, version. Okay. Now if I, so I'm gonna show you the C sharp and uh, the C sharp script uh, version now. The VB have one has very similar performance, so I will only show the C sharp one. If I okay, if I press reset button again, now if I press and hold F5. You see how much is faster, right? And if we do this from the plugin version, okay, it's gonna be even smoother, okay? All right, so I hope this benchmark kind of give you some extra motivation to, you know, jump into C sharp, <laughs> you know, <laughs> especially when you interest if you're interested in kind of these real time or iterative um, um, scripting where you update the result and when you see the result on screen uh, almost at in real time or interactively, then yeah, you really want to bring the computation time down to. At least, like uh, usually, fifty milliseconds each. Otherwise, will be too slow for interactions. All right, so let's carry on. Oh, that's a little joke. It this show actually was uh, used to be for Java uh, ma many years ago, and now I just readapted it for for Python. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, just want to give you a quick overview between what is uh, the fundamental difference between uh, the Python language and the C sharp uh, language. Um, so generally, when you are in the programming, um, the world of programming languages, um, we classified languages into generally um, two categories, two big categories called interpreted language and compiled languages. So for interpreted language, so when you write a piece of say Python script for example and then you hit the OK button that run the course, basically there this little software behind the screen that take in the text file line by line and try to translate it to machine instruction in real time. Okay, so every time you press the test and OK, the software will kick in and do essentially the, the, the text processing, okay, and try to make sense out of it on the fly, on demand. Okay. Um, on the other hand, okay, um, the other language is like compile language. So like C or Pascal, basically when you write a piece of code, uh, a piece of code, um, or the source code, and when you hit the run button, what happened is that first the source code had to be translated by the compiler into machine code. Machine code basically just, you can think of it just binary, just one and zero. It's something that we human don't understand. But this code can be executed directly by your, your computer processor. So it runs very fast because it's already in the form that the electronics uh, the, the, the electric processor can um, execute immediately, okay? And then you distribute uh, this this machine code version to your customer, and then your customers will or your clients will never see the source code, okay? So that is traditionally how um, software or program has been uh, done, okay? So you write a source code, and then you compile it once into uh, machine code, 
Okay, and then it runs uh, very fast. Uh, on the other stream, we have interpreted language, uh, interpreted uh, languages such as uh, Python. So in Python, when you write a source code and then when you press the run button, basically there's a, this special software run behind, that, that runs behind the screen called the interpreter that go through its source, uh, go through uh, its line of source code, okay, line by line, and try to translate it directly to machine instruction. Okay, so every time you run the program, you need the source code, and then the interpreter will act, will translate it to machine instruction on demand. Now, this means that you don't have to like compile it, but again, you need the source code, um, um, and the downside of that, it runs slower generally than when you compile it to. Um, to, to the low level uh, machine code that the uh, that the that the the processors can run immediately okay but the advantage of this is that when you have a short program like most of the python script that you write in grasshopper uh, you don't need to spend time compiling and you don't need to like go through many steps just to compile it you just press the play button and this software will kick in and execute the code for you okay and because most of the script that we tend or well, that we write tend to be quite simple anyway so the execution time is real it's really fast. It's almost instant. Okay, and then in the middle we have the so-called semi-compile languages, and that is basically C Sharp, uh, Visual Basic .NET, or Java. Okay, so it's sitting between these two streams because now again we have a source code, but whenever we we want to run it, there's two steps. First, we also compile it, but we don't directly compile it to the low-level zero and one or binary or, or, or binary uh, language. We compile it to something called the intermediate code that is uh, not as cryptic as just one and zero, but it's uh, much more uh, difficult to read and understand than the high-level source code that is like have the nice if else statement. Okay, now you do this once, and every time we want to run this program, we just take the sort of the intermediate code, and then there will be a real-time compiler or just-in-time compiler that will very quickly translate this code to machine instructions, okay? So uh, the C Sharp language and the uh, VB language, uh, when you hit uh, the compile uh, button or the play button, it will be compiled to pretty much the same intermediate uh, language code. Uh, that is why they can interact with each other, okay? And unless you make the change to the source code, uh, this intermediate code can be kept can be kept and run as many times as you want, and because it's already uh, halfway translate to to the low-level machine language, uh, the uh, it can be very quickly translate uh, in real time on the fly to low-level machine uh, instructions. Okay, that is why it generally has a higher performance than uh, the purely uh, interpreted language like Python. Okay, so um, let's uh, jump in. Um, to um, some of the first concepts. So um, ma uh, many of you here ha already uh, know Python, so I keep make reference to uh, Python because uh, if you already know this concept in Python, it make it easier for you to know the uh, equivalent concept in C Sharp. But if you don't know Python or if you watch it from uh, the live stream, uh, it's not essential. It's not like absolutely uh, essential to know this Python concept in order to. Uh, Follow through with the C sharp part. Okay, so uh, in Python uh, you declare a variable which is a, um, like an abstract container that holds some value. So uh, a equal to twelve, which means that I, in the memory of the computer, I declare a container called a, and then I store a number twelve in it. Or uh, here I declare another container, another variable, and I store number three point four fourteen in it. Uh, another variable here, I, and then I store this time the value is actually a piece of text or we call it a string in program language and this is the content of, of, of that text okay here we basically we we already have this variable above here which changed the contents inside the variable to a new value okay now in C sharp whenever you want to define or uh, want to define a variable you actually have to do two steps first you have to declare it by declare the type of data that the variable holds. Okay, so let's say if I want to declare a variable called A, and I only want this variable to hold data uh, of type integer number. Okay, so I basically say int, which is the keyword. So keyword uh, I write in green here. So uh, the keyword 
uh, that show the data type of the variable, okay? And the statement ends with a semicolon, okay? So this statement basically say, I want to declare a variable that holds integer. Now the integer has no value yet. It has not been initialized to an initial value yet, okay? So in the next slide, I will say a equal to 12, okay? And then the semicolon, because this is a separate statement. Okay, now I can combine these two lines in one single line. So, for example, I can declare another variable. This time, a variable can be, it's stored decimal number. Now, in C sharp, uh, decimal number um, is called a double. Okay, so this type is called a double. And then we declare it, and then in the same line, the same statement, we can assign an initial value to it. And then at the end of the statement, uh, don't forget a semicolon. All right, uh, here is the next one. So um, we declare a new variable uh, of type string that, because this is a string variable, you can only store data that has the matching type uh, in this variable. So we store this, the piece of text called header rhino inside. All right. And now in the next slide, uh, now I already have the variable B that I declare here. So here I don't really declare it again. I only say B equal to new value. And uh, as you can see, I missed the semicolon here. So if you run this code, it will give you an error message. So my bad. <laughs> okay, so if you already declare a variable, you don't want, you, you can't declare it again. You can reuse and reassign value to it. But here, if you attempt to say double B equal to 1.23, and then you run this code, then uh, the C sharp uh, program will throw an error. It will say that B has already been declared above. Okay. So uh, generally, uh, this is uh, called explicit typing because the program language will guess the type of the data for you behind the scene automatically. While here, you as the programmer are responsible, will be responsible to explicitly specify the type of a variable, okay? So please raise your hand if you have never worked with this kind of language where you have to explicitly declare the type of the variable before. Okay, so you've never done that, okay? All right, so um, related to this data type, so again, uh, I make a reference back to Python now, just in case you already know Python, so it's easier for you to compare. So in Python, um, the type of a variable can be changed uh, from time to time. So here, um, A now holds an integer, but the next line, you store a piece of text in it, and uh, the language is totally okay with that. So you can change the type uh, that the variable holds. However, in C-sharp, once you declare that A holds integer, then from that point onward, A can only hold integer. If you try to like redeclare A, or assign um, some data that is uh, not of the type that A is supposed to store, then you will get an error message. Okay, so this is not allowed in um, C sharp. So this is called a static typing, which means that the types cannot change. Here, generally, we call it dynamic typing, where the type can change. Uh, so the um, both of these uh, way of programming has advantages and disadvantages. So for example, in Python, if you declare a variable called my variable and you assign value to it, and then you have a many many live codes uh, down later, and then you want to change the the value of this uh, guy to something else. But let's say that you when you type the code, you misspell it. Okay. Now what happened is that the Python programming language will think that you want to declare a brand new variable and will happily let you do so. Okay. And then this this is definitely not, not your intention. This is just a typo. But usually you maybe you want to be aware of that. And then when you try to reuse this variable down here, uh, it may cause problem. Okay. Now in the C sharp world, uh, you declare a variable. Okay, and then again, I'm missing the semicolon here, so that's uh, my bad. Uh, then later on, if you want to change the variable and then you misspell it, uh, it will throw an error, say that my variable has never been declared before. Okay, so it stops you even before you. Uh, so when you compile the code, it will detect the error even during the compile state and it will throw an error message. Okay, so th this. Uh, so the advantage of this is that it prevents this kind of error, especially when you write a long piece of code that has so many code in between, and it's difficult for you to like um, uh, mentally keep track of what's going on. Okay, uh, but of course it's put more responsible, uh, more uh, 
a more um, re a requirement on you, so you have to explicitly declare the type. Okay, this one is more flexible. But however, it put more responsible on you. It assumes that you like know what you are doing. You are fully aware of what you are doing. Okay, so um, let's try a simple um, script. Okay, so um, we're gonna make a simple component, a C sharp component that basically just adds two number together. So um, for those of you who's already used the Python component, you will see that the C sharp component is pretty similar. In fact, the C sharp component has been there much longer, and then the Python component will just take the same kind of graphical user interface and then adapt it to the Python language. Okay, so now let's start uh, Rhino and Grasshopper. And then we're going to do this simple example where we type in some code and basically the code just takes in two input and adds them together and output it. Okay, so if we type um, C sharp script, okay. That's components uh, also appeared <coughs> here in the uh, math category, okay? <coughs> All right, now if you uh, Zoom in. Okay, so this component uh, by default is second. It takes in two inputs x and y, and it has one output called a. Uh, this default output out is not really an output. This is just where we can display message uh, for debugging. It is not meant to be used as the main output. Okay, now you can add more input and output to it. So if you zoom in close enough, uh, similar to the Python component, if you already uh, know how to use the Python component, you can add more input. Okay. For now, we just keep it uh, with two inputs, so x and y. Okay, let's put in. Okay, now we have to declare the type of inputs. Okay, because C sharp is explicit. So let's right click on this input. Okay, we go to type hint. Okay, how. I'm I'm on dual screen now, and when I go to type in, the other uh, menu actually appear on my second screen. <laughs> but anyway, if you go to type in, ah, here, right. Uh, we basically we can select uh, one of the uh, predefined uh, types here. Now we want x to be a number, a decimal number. So we're going to choose the type of decimal number, and it is called double in the C sharp uh, programming language. So let's go to type in, and we choose a double. All right, uh, same with y. Okay, now for the output, we don't choose the type because, um, well, we're going to decide the type inside the script. And then when we send that data outside to the output, this is a component we already know the type, okay? All right. Now let's input in some number. So I'm gonna do a slider. It's so probably two point three. Okay. Then I have another number here. Probably just four. Right, I will also make a little panel for the output so I can see it. Okay, now um, to open the script editor, we double click on uh, the component. All right, and when you open the script, now for those of you who use Python, uh, and then 
Now looking at the C# uh, component as a Python uh, user, you will be a little bit uh, shocked by the number of template codes that appear. Uh, in fact, uh, this is just like a bare minimum. If you expand the code, you will see that there's a, like even way more template codes here. <laughs> Anyway, fear not, uh, because <laughs> all you need to type in the code is right here. This little part here, okay, you can ignore the rest for now, okay? Okay, so uh, here inside this part here called the run script, uh, okay, uh, you will see that it say we have an input uh, of type double, uh, an input called x of type double, an input uh, called y of type double, and an output a of this which type called reference object. Okay, you will understand what it means later. Okay, now this part is generated automatically. Okay, so it's gray out. You cannot edit this part. Okay, okay, you can only type code in the white part. Okay, so now we do something simple. We just say a the output equal to x plus y and semicolon. All right, and now if we <coughs> press OK, OK, we execute the code and close the script editor. Okay, you should get the result out here. Okay. Now, um, we double-click again to open the script editor. All right, so essentially that's how you uh, type code and run it. Now, uh, just a few notes. So when you press OK, it will close the script editor and execute the code. Uh, in fact, uh, as I explained earlier, when you execute, there's actually two steps. First, it has to compile it to this intermediate code, and then this intermediate code will uh, run as many times as you want, okay? So the executions, uh, so the, 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 the compiling is only run when you change the source code and press OK. So that's why the first time, you let's say I make some change and then press OK, you might notice it takes a lot of time for this component to run because it, it has to compile and then run. But if I change it, change the input, you see the same code can run, but the, the code inside doesn't have to be recompiled again. That's why this time it, it runs so fast, it doesn't output of that time again. So generally in Grasshopper, if you don't see the time output, uh, that is because it runs for less than one millisecond. Okay, so anything run than what, run than less, for less than uh, less than one millisecond will not be displayed here. Okay, but let's say if you, I make some change, okay, and then I press OK, you will see that it will take some time to, uh, well it detects that there's no change in the code, but let me make another statement. For example, I press OK, See, it has to recompile, that's why it takes longer the first time, okay? Anyway, so that is what happens when you press OK. Well, now, when you press the play button, it will execute the code, but will not close the script editor, okay? So when you press play, okay, the script editor will not be closed. Now, when you, the script editor is open, and then when you click outside the editor, uh, the ed then the editor will be minimized, Okay, so by default, it will be minimized to the little thing here. Okay, and then you double click on it and it will expand. Um, here can be a bit of trouble though. So it, as you can see here, I have this script editor being minimized, uh, which is still active. Now, if I double click it again, I will open another script editor. Okay, and if you dry code in this one, and then you minimize it and you have another one. And then if you go back to this one, it will be the own code. So it's pretty confusing, okay? So generally, uh, my advice is that you disable the minimization altogether by, see this, this button? If you turn it off, then it will not minimize. So when you click outside the script editor, it will not minimize, okay? Yeah, the last one you click OK will override the previous one. Yeah, so it happened to me many times before, so I'd rather not minimize it. All right. Let's move on. 
Okay, so that's a simple component that adds two things together. So um, for those of you who write Python script before, the only difference is you have to declare the type. Uh, you have to right-click on the input part of the component and choose the type. Okay, uh, the, the remaining part is almost similar. You just say a equal to x plus y and the semicolon, obviously. All right, so let's let's move on next. Uh, so um, gonna we're gonna introduce a new um, uh, some new syntax here. Uh, that is the new keyword. Okay, so for the standard um, data type like number or string, you can just type in the number or the piece of text directly. Uh, but for some more complex, more uh, non-default or non-built-in type of data, you have to use a new keyword. For example, let's say. This time we create a variable a. Uh, the type of variable is going to be pawn 3 d So pawn 3 d is not a type defined by C-sharp language, like uh, a double or an integer or a string. This is a type defined by the Rhino software itself. Okay. Um, so when you use a C-sharp component, all of the type defined by Rhino Common will already be visible or accessible to the C-sharp component. So we don't have to like do anything extra. We just like need to use we, we can like use or call those types uh, directly. Okay, so here we create a, a variable a of type on 3D. Okay, so that's what the left hand side does. Now the right hand side will create the actual value or data. Okay, and then we store the data in the variable. Okay, in, or, in order to create the data, we use the new keyword together with this um, special function called the constructor. Okay, what is the constructor? We're gonna learn later on. But basically, a constructor is a special uh, command uh, that has the same spelling, exactly the same spelling as the type of the data. Okay, but it's it's a command, so we take in some input. So we have the bracket here. Uh, by def um, this default version of the Pond 3D uh, constructor doesn't take in any input, so we leave the bracket empty, and this will create a point uh, with the default x, y, z coordinate, uh, namely zero, zero, zero. Okay, and then a semicolon. Okay, so again, the left and right hand side will create the actual data of a point whose coordinate is x, y, z, and then we store a point in a variable a. Okay, and the variable a, according to our declaration, can only store data of type Pond 3D. So if you say Pond 3D A and then you say equal to Hello Rhino, which is not a Pond 3D, uh, you will get an error message, for example. All right. Now, uh, next in the next line, uh, we declare a new variable B. This time, uh, we again create the actual point data, but this time we use another version of the Pond 3D uh, constructor that take in a free custom number for X, Y, Z. Okay, so the X is going to be zero, and one, and two. Okay, now in the next line, uh, I create another a variable c, and this time, instead of creating a brand new data, I take the data that's already stored in a variable b and copy it over to c. Okay, so c now should be a point whose coordinates are also zero, one, and two. Okay, so let's try this. Okay, let's create a new input called big B. Okay, so if we zoom in, create a new input by pressing the plus button. Okay, it will be called uh, capital B by default. Okay. All right, go back uh, to the uh, script editor by double click on the component. Now this time we will see B equal to. Let me make it a little bit bigger. So B equal to. Okay, so B is already a variable. So the, we, we don't need to declare any variable here. We just create the data right away. Okay, so to create the actual data, we say use new keyword and then use the constructor, pond 3D, and bracket. Okay, we put in some uh, coordinate. So the x coordinate, I will use just um, the, the value of, of the x input part here. So I just x. Y, okay, and for Z, uh, I just use 0, 0. And don't forget the semicolon. And then I press OK. And then on the screen, you should see a point appear at the coordinate uh, X, Y, and Z.
Okay, and as you change the input, the script will be executed again for the new input, and you see the change. Okay. So any geometry that you output will be displayed automatically. Okay, non-geometric information like a number that we output at input uh, at the output port A uh, will not be displayed on the screen, but can be visualized using um, some other components, like for example the the panel component in Grasshopper. Okay, that's how you create a point um, 3D object or a point 3D uh, piece of data. And later we're gonna have more cap data like uh, curve, uh, vector 3D, uh, line, circle, uh, mesh, wrap. Okay, all of those t uh, data types uh, were defined inside the Rhino Common Library. Those were not like the default built-in uh, C sharp types at all. All right. Um, so, uh, by the way, uh, you may wonder: um, Is it possible if you just say zero, one, and two rather than zero point zero, one point zero, and two point zero? Yes, uh, you can. Uh, however, um, in programming language, there is um, quite a significant difference between a decimal number and an integer number. When you actually explicit explicitly say point zero, you actually means that this is a decimal number, not an integer. Okay, now in some case, uh, the point three D functions or the point three D uh, constructor, it expect it to give it expect you to give it three decimal values. So that's why I I want to be explicit and say point zero. But in this case, in 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 C sharp, whenever you are asked to be uh, to give the code a decimal, and but when you give it a, an integer instead, then that integer will be automatically converted to a decimal for you behind the scene. So the answer is uh, yes, you can put in zero and one and two without the point zero, and we'll be fine. But as you will see later on, there will be many cases it's good to be explicit because it reminds you that this is a decimal. If you input an integer, um, there are many cases where you have a very weird um, um, uh, error. Okay, um, this is another sample, but um, it's similar to the one we've done. So we have a component. Okay, we, we skip this one because it's uh, almost identical to the one that we have just done. We just create a point from the custom coordinates that we input in from the grasshopper canvas. All right, so now we know how to create a variable and like declare new data uh, and define data to store in those variables. Uh, now we move on to the next thing called the if statement. So, uh, in uh, again, uh, a reference back to Python. So in Python, um, instead of execute a code from top to bottom, you can decide when to execute a group uh, of lines of codes or not. Okay, so let's say you have a two variable called A and B, and then if A is greater than B, then you execute these two lines of code. Otherwise, you execute these two lines of code, okay? Uh, <coughs> now, in C sharp. Uh, this is how you write it. So you have the if keyword, okay, uh, and then the condition. So the condition is always go in bracket, okay. Uh, the condition has to be an expression that can be evaluated to true and false, okay. So a and b. If a and b are number, so then a greater than b is something that you can evaluate to true and false. But if, if you say if a plus one, uh, that would be meaningless because a plus one cannot be evaluated to true or false, okay. Okay, so if this thing is uh, correct, then you execute this piece of code. Okay, so uh, all the codes inside this part of the if statement has to be enclosed in the curly bracket here. Okay, uh, and now here in the else section, all the code in else will has to be enclosed in the curly bracket. Okay, so let's try this out. So I'm gonna create a new C# -sharp component. With two number, okay, okay. So if I right click and change the name of this input to A, and change the name of this input to B, okay, and change the type to a double because we want this to be number again.
All right, now if we double click on the script editor, then we're gonna say, so if bracket A greater than B, curly brackets, Okay, so my habit is that when I open the curly bracket before I type any code, I close the curly bracket immediately, so I won't forget it. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna print out something. So in the C sharp component, there is a special command of functions that call print with capital P. Okay. And print will to take in a string. Okay, so let's put in a string. We will say A is greater than B. Okay, so that is the first message that we're gonna print. So, what what message you print will be appear in the output part called out here. Okay, so we print another uh, message in the next line of the uh, output. We will say b is smaller than a, for example. All right, and optionally. We have the else part, so the else is entirely optional. If there's no else, then nothing will be executed. We will say a is smaller than b. Okay, this time I have only one statement here, for example. All right, if we uh, test this code, you should see a message coming out. Depends on the relationship between the, between the A and the B that you import. Okay. All right, so uh, in C sharp, uh, whenever you ha whenever um, you have only one statement between a pair of curly bracket, you can remove the curly bracket altogether. Okay, if you have only one statement. Okay, but if you have more than if you have two or more, then you need a curly bracket to group them together. Okay, for example. Now, as you can see, um, to make the code easier to read, I indent it. So I open the curly bracket and then I indent the code to kind of signify that this part of the code is is inside the if statement. Okay. However, in C sharp, the indentation is purely for readability. It has no effect on the code. So if I I don't indent, the code still runs fine. Okay. In fact, uh, I don't even need to break the line. I can write everything in one single line. So the separation is the semicolon. The semicolon is used to, uh, to signify the separations of it uh, between different statements. Um, when you the, the line break symbol is purely for readability. So if I have these two guys on the same line, the code still runs fine. For example, okay. So uh, in one extreme case, for example, I. If your statement is very short, you can write it like in one single line, for example, like this. This is actually a bad example uh, for uh, uh, to, to use in one line because um, the statement is quite long, okay? But if you have a short statement, uh, I can condense if else to basically two lines, for example. And it still runs, okay? Because the, the space and the line break has no effect on the logic of the code, okay? All right, uh, let's move on. So um, the for loop, 
So what if you want to execute the same piece of code uh, over and over again, but with just a slightly different uh, value each time? So uh, for those of you who really, who who are already know Python, um, you know that uh, there is this thing called the for loop. Okay, so in Python, uh, this is how you write a for loop. So this is a, st uh, a statement that basically executes the print command five times. Each time this thing runs, the variable i will take a different value. The first time it runs, it, i will be zero, and print i will basically print the number zero to the output part. Uh, and then this command will be run again, and i will be increased by one, okay, until i reach five, okay. So this code will run for five times. Uh, I'm sorry, four times. So zero, one, two, and three and four. It will stop just before it reaches the end. Okay, so for those of you who know Python, that is how you've done it. And this is like the equivalence in C sharp. Okay, so you have a for statement. Uh, you have the for keyword and then the bracket. Now in the bracket, you need to supply three part. Uh, these three parts are separated by the semicolon. Now, the first part is you declare a temporary variable to hold uh, the so-called counter. Okay, so the counter is going to be i. Okay, and we initiate. So the i is integer. It is initialized to zero at first. Okay, and this is the condition for it to stop. So. If i is less than five, then the code will run. Okay, and each time the code runs, it will after each time the code runs, it will increase by one. Okay, so this syntax look a little bit weird, but um, you, you you will get used to it uh, soon. Okay, so this part will run uh, five times. Each time I will take a different values, so I will be zero at first, and it will run as long as i less than five. Okay, so this should stop. When I reach a four, it will do the final execution when I is four. Okay. Okay. Now inside the for loop, I can have many lines of code, and those lines of code will be enclosed in the curly bracket. Again, here I have the indentation just for readability. Okay. Unlike in Python, where the indentation is like required. Uh. All right. So uh, the difference is that now remember the print commands in the C# -sharp component. The print only accept string. Okay. So but now I give it i. I is not a string or not not, not a piece of text. Uh, it's, it's a number. So I have to explicitly or like manually convert it to a piece of text by calling the special functions or command called to string. Okay. So in C# -sharp, anything any variable uh, can be converted to a string uh, by dot to string. And then empty bracket. Okay. So let's try this quickly. Okay. So now in the same components. Okay. Below the if else statement, okay, I gonna print for int y equal to zero, y less than five i plus plus, okay, curly bracket, print i dot to string. That is the first pair bracket, and then another pair bracket, okay. 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 So this is a basic example. We're gonna see more uh, complicated example um, later on, where we're gonna do something more interesting, like creating geometry rather than just simply print out or display the value of this special counter variable. All right. Again, here, if you have only one statement, you can remove the curly bracket altogether. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, the list. 
So uh, a list is a special kind of uh, variable that can hold multiple variables inside. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who uh, have already been programming in Python, this is how you create a list and start it in a variable. Okay. So you declare a list called my my numbers, and then you initialize it to a list that holds two numbers, 0 0.5 and 3.14, okay? In the next line, we append or we add one extra number to the end of the list, okay? And then we add another one. And then we can retrieve the element from the list by using the square bracket and the index number. So zero will return the zero uh, element of the list from left to right, okay? So uh, the index always count from zero. All right, so now this is the equivalence in uh, C sharp. It's gonna be a bit more uh, cumbersome at first. So first, we left hand side, right hand side. Okay, so the left hand side, we declare a variable called my numbers. And again, in C sharp, whenever you declare a variable, you have to specify specify the types. Okay, so this variable can only store a list of of decimal. Okay, so I say list. And then there's this uh, weird little syntax here, the, the triangular bracket, okay? Uh, this basically specifies the, the list is can only hold a uh, decimal number, okay? So that's the left-hand side. Now the right-hand side actually creates the data of the list so that I can start in the variable, okay? So again, I use the new keyword, so new list double, okay? And then the empty bracket, okay? So whenever you use the new keyword and you called the constructor, which basically had the exact same spelling as the data type, okay, followed by the bracket with optional data, okay, and normally you stop here, this will give you an empty list. However, with the list, you have the chance to open the curly bracket and throw in some default initial data, okay? And then we stop this, uh, this statement with a semicolon. All right, now, after you have that list which is stored in the variable called my numbers, you can keep adding thing to uh, uh, adding new numbers to the list by saying my numbers dot add, okay. All right, and now we um, to retrieve of the element we use the square bracket, okay. So if you call the variable that represent the variable that stored the list, and then give it a square bracket together with an integer that specify the index or the position of the element that you want to retrieve, okay. Then this whole thing will give you the number, and we convert this number to a piece of text so that we can print it, okay. All right. We're not going to um, do this live in um, in in Grasshopper yet. We're going to save it for some more uh, complicated um, example later on. All right, uh, now what about we use a for loop to create a linear array of points? Okay, so um, you know how to create a single point uh, early on. Now we're going to use the for loops, okay, to create a new points, and then we start in a list, okay? So let's switch back to Grasshopper. Let me create a new component, C sharp. All right, this time we input in the number n that specify how many points that we are going to generate it. So n has to be an integer. Okay, I don't need the uh, input y, so probably I can just remove it. All right, and A will big capital A will be the output. Okay, so we're gonna inside the script we're gonna create a list of a point 3D, and then we're gonna send that list out to the output part A. Okay, so if we double click and open the script editor, all right. So first, uh, let's create an empty list of point 3D. So we say list point 3D. All right, so whenever I name the variable, I always, for, so for list or for um, variable that holds multiple data, like list, and then we have array and dictionary, I always use uh, the plural form. So instead of saying point as my variable name, I say points, okay? 
equal to okay now we so that is the variable okay this variable has no data so now we create a data first we, we create an, a data uh, to start this variable uh, in this variable and this data is basically just an empty list so new list point 3d and then the empty round bracket All right. Now we use the for loop to run n times, and each time the um, uh, the for loops run, we create a new point, and then we add it to the list points. So for i for int i, I'm sorry, for int i equal to zero semicolon i less than small n i plus plus. Oh, forget a bracket. All right. Now inside the for loop, first we create a point. Okay. So let's declare a point variable called point singular without the s. So point equal to. Okay. So that's a variable point, and now we need to actually create the data to store in that variable. So new point three D. All right bracket and then we're going to give it the xyz coordinate so i will just use the value of the counter i for my x coordinate okay for y and z i will just use zero and zero for now and i will add this point to the list points okay so i will say points dot add capital a bracket point <coughs> semicolon okay now after the for loop finish my list points will be filled with n points okay now the last thing i want to do is just to output this the variable, um, the variable points or the data inside the variable points to the output part A. Okay, so I will say A equal to points. Semicolon. All right, and then let's put in something for N. So I will say 10. And we should see 10 points lined up along the x-axis. Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, you're allowed to ask. So whenever you it asks for a double, uh, and it, you give it an integer, it will convert automatically for you, okay? But there's some case it's um, it doesn't know to convert, and then you get a weird um, error coming out. Yeah. So uh, a common problem is when you say three divided by i. So three is an integer, and if i is an integer, it will perform an integer division. For example, three divided by four will be Zero rather than zero point seventy five, even though you want it to be zero zero point seventy five. So in that case, you have to explicitly convert it to a double. Otherwise, you would your answer will be zero rather than zero zero point seventy five. Uh, so again, feel free to ask a question. Ben and uh, Dong um, Dong Yu will be here to uh, help you as well. So if you raise your hand, uh, he will come to help. Huh? You see the code again?
Okay, uh, let's move on. All right, um, there is another version of the um, for loop called the for each loop, okay? So uh, the purpose of the for each loop is that it makes it a little bit easier or natural to uh, visit its element in uh, a list and then perform some actions or run some code on each of those individual elements, okay? So let's say that we have a list of points um, that we create earlier, okay? Uh, using the for each loop, we can visit each point, okay? So, so each time um, the for each loop run, it will take each individual element of the list point and store it in this temporary variable called point uh, of type point three, obviously. And then from within of the body of the for each loop, we can do something interesting with the point. For example, we can draw a circle uh, based on this point, for example. All right, let me show you. So let's come back. All right, let's say here we already have the list of points, okay? Now we visit this list of points and then we create a circle. Uh, we start in a list of circle and then we output it in the output part B. Okay, so let's create a new output part called B. All right, so we add some more code here. All right, so first let's create an empty list of circle. Okay, so there's this new data type inside the random common library called circle with a capital C. Okay, okay, we so that is the type. Okay, now the variable name uh, gonna be circles. Okay, and then we initialize it to an empty list of circle. All right, now we're gonna use the um, for each loop to visit each point in the list points and use each of those points to uh, create a circle. So now for each bracket, okay. Now we declare a temporary variable of type point 3D, okay. The name of the variable gonna be point, okay. And then in points, okay. All right, so based on this point, we're gonna create a circle. So let's declare a variable to start a circle. So now the data type is circle, okay? Now the variable name is circle again, but with lowercase, okay? So data type um, almost always start with uppercase, except the standard uh, type like string or int or double, those are the default c sharp type, so they start with lowercase. But almost all other data type like list, point three, circle, mesh, they always start with uh, uppercase, okay? Uh, variable name, we always name it by, by convention, A variable name should always be lowercase, start with lowercase, okay? And whenever you have a new word, uh, so I mean the name can be um, a, a, a concatenation of many English words, so whenever you uh, have a new word in that phrase, you can use the uppercase to distinguish uh, that new word. However, the first character of the first word should always be lowercase, okay? So circle type, circle variable name equal to, okay, let's create a new circle, okay? So we call, so we use new, and then we call the special command, our constructor, circle, that has the exact same spelling as the type, of the data type that we try to, to create, okay? Then we open the bracket, okay? Now the circle constructor, it takes in, it has actually has seven different versions, and if we scroll through, there's a, it basically it has a version that takes in a point as a center, and then a radius, okay? And this will give us a circle uh, on the flat xy plane at the center that we specify and at the radius that we specify, okay? So now the center gonna be the point that we retrieve from the list, okay? So we put a point here, okay? And then comma, 
and we give it a radius. So the radius is going to be uh, 0 0.5 for now. All right, so after this line, uh, we have a variable called circle that actually holds a circle data, uh, I mean, a uh, piece of data that, that represents a circle, the actual circle. Now we add the circle to the list circles. Okay, so circles dot add circle. All right. And then this for loop will be executed for 10 times because we um, have 10 points in the list points. Okay, so each time this thing runs, it will create a new circle and then add it to the end of the list of circles, okay? And then we just need to output the list of circles to the output part B. Oops, there. Uh, this should be plural. I forgot an S when I refer to the list circles. Okay. Oh, when you open the um, RAL bracket, uh, it should show, but sometimes it takes some time for the library to load up, so you have to wait a while. Uh, this code editor is quite, um, frankly, quite pathetic in general. Uh, the autocomplete uh, and the auto system tool is pretty lame. Uh, from tomorrow, uh, we're going to switch to Visual Studio, and you're going to see how a real, code a real code editor is supposed to behave, okay? <laughs> Okay, shall I move on? Okay, we've done this line example, so create a list of circle from a list of center points. We've done that. All right, now uh, we're going to have a slightly more complex uh, example, again using for loops and list, but this time going to be uh, uh, not as trivial as just creating a bunch of points and circles. Okay, so we're going to do something called the subdivision curve. Okay, uh, raise your hand if you've heard of this before. Subdivision curve. Okay, so a few of you. Okay, so how subdivision curve work? So uh, subdivision curve is one of the techniques um, to uh, generate curve from strange lines uh, in common graphics. So traditionally, um, when we want to draw a curve in common graphics, um, there was the first algorithm that like, can generate a free form curve was uh, the Bezier curve algorithm, and then later on uh, it was generalized to uh, the so called NURBS curve that is very popular in uh, Rhino, like it's the standard uh, way to do curve and curve surface in Rhino. The subdivision curve is kind of um, another way to um, generate curve by by starting from some sort of strange line segment and keep subdividing it rather than having, rather than coming up with an exact equation to describe a curve like in the case of a nurse curve. Okay, so how do we do that? So let's look at an, an example. So in order to generate a subdivision curve, um, we specify in some control points, and these control points will influence the actual shape, the final shape of the curve that we're going to generate. Okay, so these control points are uh, comes uh, this this control points come in a specific uh, a specific order so the the order or the index number does matter okay so we start from zero one two three and four and basically from these five points we want to like draw some sort of a smooth curve that is influenced by the position of these initial points okay so how do we do it we're going to do it in many steps so at the zero step okay the zero step basically you do nothing apart from connecting all of these guys together and form a like a, a polyline and well we call this a curve it is like the zero, the zero level curve so it looks nothing like a curve obviously now 
from what we get, we apply this subdivision rule uh, over and over again. So how this subdivision rule work? Now for each line segment, we take the one quarter point and the three quarter point. Okay. So for each segment, we take the point at the one quarter position and the three quarter position of each segment, and then we connect them together. And then this is the next level of the subdivision curve. Okay. Now we repeat the exact same thing again. So take the one quarter point and the three quarter point of each new segment and connect them. And you see how it slowly approach a curve. But this curve is like purely made out of strained segment. Okay. So it's already kind of rational line uh, as it as we generate it. Okay. So now how we uh, do this? Um, by the way, the name of the subdivision rules uh, was invented actually a long time ago, 1974, even when we have like uh, personal computers. Uh, and if you do it an infinite number of times, it will uh, convert to um, a, a degree to curve. Uh, we're going to test it later on uh, by using um, the, the, um, the, the grasshopper component um, that generate uh, the curve and we're going to set the degree to 2 and see if that curve generated by grasshopper match perfectly with our subdivision curve okay so let's set this up in grasshopper and then we're going to I'm going to show you how to do it in code all right so I'm going to disable all of this component okay let's start a brand new C# -sharp component All right, the first input is going to be a list of control points. So we uh, right click and we change the name to control points. So uh, this, the first character of the variable name is always lowercase and uh, control points. Uh, the, the, the P in the word points is capital because it's, uh, it's a separate word. Okay, the data type for this guy is going to be a list of points 3D. So we right click and we choose the list input. So right click and we choose list. Okay. And then in the type pin, we're going to choose point 3D. Type in point 3D. Now the next input is going to specify how many times we want to keep subdividing this curve. Okay. So it's going to be. So this, the name of the second input parameter is going to be called iteration count, okay, with lowercase i and capital C. And the type of this variable is going to be an integer. So we right click, type in an integer. The output, um, I call it curve, which as you already know, it's not curve, it's just actually a list of line segments or a polyline. Okay. Now let's input in some points for the control point. So I will gonna do um, seven points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. For iteration count, I'm gonna create a slider and I limit it to seven. I strongly advise you to limit the slider to something like 7 or 8, otherwise you might accident accidentally set it to 100 and then this thing will run forever and you will have to force close right now and lose your script. Okay, once you set up, now we can actually walk through the code. So um, from now on, um, if you already like um, um, attend my uh, Python seminar before, you know that I always put the codes uh, on the slide so I can go through it with you e easier. And then we're gonna leave some. Uh, I'm gonna leave you some time so we type in the code together. Okay. So from now on, almost every single example we do, we have um, code on the slide. 
All right, so if you double click the C sharp component, um, you will see the run script components now will take any input uh, on control points. The type is a list of point 30. Uh, the second input is going to be an integer uh, called iteration count, and then the output is called curve. All right. All right, so the goal is that from the list of control points, we want to generate the, the new control points of the next level of the curve, okay? So let's create a brand new empty list. So let me walk you through first, and then we're going to type in uh, the code together. Or uh, if you're confident, uh, you can even copy and paste. Uh, or if you follow me, how you can always copy and paste, no problem. OK, so uh, we create a brand new list of control points. We call new control points. And our goal is from the current control points, we need to compute the new control points. OK, so how do we do that? OK, so we visit each segment or each control point at a, that, uh, uh, that we currently have. OK, so for i from 0 to the count of the control points, minus 1. OK, the reason why minus 1, because we don't want to uh, go to the last control point, because we want to stop at the next to last control point. OK? All right. So using the i, we can obtain the current control point and the next control point. Uh, from where we are, okay, and from those two control points, the, the two red control points at position i and position i plus one, we can compute the one quarter point and the three quarter point. Okay, so let's compute the one quarter point at the current position i. Okay, so one quarter point is equal to um, three quarter of this guy plus one quarter of this guy. So this is a linear interpolation method that gives you a point one quarter of the way, okay. This is basically you just like combine these two guys, but instead of using a weight of 50, 50, which will give you exact middle point, you give uh, the weight which is 75% plus 25%, and that will give you something that end up here. So this is the one quarter point. Okay, and then we add this quarter point, uh, this one quarter point to the list of new control points. Okay, so the list of new control points will hold all of the yellow points as we go along the, the red points. All right, now we can do the same for the three quarter point. So same idea. This time we use the weight. Uh, the weight is going to be one quarter plus a three quarter, and then we add it to the new control points. Okay. Now, this will take us to the next step or uh, to the next level of the curve. So we get a new con uh, the list. So after this line uh, right here, the new control points uh, will start basically on the uh, the yellow points. Okay. And then we want to make the new control points the current control points. The reason is that because we're going to repeat this whole procedure again for a number of times. Okay, so that's why we need to do this like variable swap trick at the end, so that our current point will now be the new control points. All right, and you're going to run this as many times as we specify, like seven times. And after this, the list of control points will start the all of the control points, the many control points of the final level of the curve. And from those points, we can construct um, a graph of um, a rhino polyline and then output it to the curve uh, output part. So I would say curve equal to, here we create a new po uh, polyline curve. So this is a rhino common data type again. So new polyline curve. This constructor take in a list of points, okay, which we already compute here. So we put it in. This will generate a control. Uh, this will generate a polyline curve, and then we send it to the output directly, okay. So, so I know this is a lot of thing for you. So I'm gonna type in with you manually, so we can have a chance to basically revisit this, co uh, this code once more, okay. So C sharp components. Okay, so for we have a master for loop outside that run for iteration count number of time. Okay, so for j equal for int j equal to int j equal to zero, j less than iteration count j plus plus. Okay, open and close curly brackets right away. So you don't have to. Uh, so 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 you won't forget to close it later on. All right. Now we create a brand new list of new control points. New control points.
and from now we have a second for loop that visit each control point in the current list of control points okay and try to compute the one quarter and three quarter points Then we add this one quarter point to the list of new control points. And we do exactly what well, we do a similar thing for the three quarter point, just change the variable name and the weighting. Everything right on the live stream. Okay, thanks. Okay. Finally, the we're gonna swap the control points and the new control points. Okay, so now the new control point will become our current control points. All right, now we create a new polyline and send it to the output port curve. Curve equal to new polyline curve. And give us a list of control points. So Facebook app we say that um, the, the video view is like seven thousand something. So that is one hundred and um, seventy-four. So that's the big live viewers, and then there's another statistic called um, video so views. Uh, okay, so that's the number of views and then number of viewers. That's the Alright, so let's run this code. Okay, I have an error, maybe I mistyped something here. Uh, I missed the plural, control points should be plural.
tomorrow when uh, we do the coding visual studio you will see that this misspell error will almost never occur because autocomplete works very well in that code editor here uh frankly it's it kind of sucks uh, most of the time <laughs> all right um, you should see a curve coming out and as you move the control points or change the number of iteration um, you can see how this curve get um finer and smoother over time. Yeah, well, um, if you ha the code is also in the slide, by the way. Uh, dot count yeah. um, that is equal to the length in Python. Yeah, that's tell you how many elements in the list. Yeah. All right, raise your hand if you need more time. Okay. Okay, so uh, something I want to point out, what, what happened here is that, okay, this for loop going to run uh, multiple times, right? The, big, the, the outer for loop, uh, the for loop that used the counter J, it's run multiple times. Now each time it runs, it creates a brand new variable called new control point. So it used the same name, but each time it like called a new list command, so it like create a brand new entity list every time. The old list basically has been like reassigned to control points, okay? Now, um, here I separate this into two lines of code, so I compute the one quarter pawn and then I add a quarter pawn to the list. But I mean, um, if you like uh, get used to C sharp over time, you will know you probably will tend to like condense these two lines of code into one single line. So rather than creating a temporary variable to hold the, the result of this uh, formula here, I can do it in one line like this. Okay, let me show you again. This is what we have now. This is how we can condense it into one line of code. Okay, so this means that we don't have to declare the temporary variable. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move on now. All right. Um, why curve decrease is usually free by default? Um, actually, before I do that, uh, I just want to demonstrate that the curve that we generate perfectly match uh, a degree two curve um, generated by the grasshopper. Now, when I say perfect, uh, I only talk about the, the central part. Now, the ending, the starting, and the ending of the curve are re require special treatment that we did not implement. Okay. So please ignore the um, beginning and ending and only look at the middle part of the curve. So now from the same control points, let's create a um, uh, NURBS curve using Grasshopper. I'm not sure what is the, the command NURBS. NURBS curve, I think this one, okay. Okay, it's taking a list of control points called vertices and the degree. Okay, let's change the degree to two. 
I plug it in, I should get uh, something coming out, and as you can see, uh, the curve matched perfectly in the middle section. Okay. It can actually be proved mathematically that the, the one quarter and three quarter rule that we apply, if you like, keep doing it infinitely a number of times, then you will get a perfect uh, second degree nerve curve. So it's kind of a useful way to get a, to rationalize a curve. Now you might notice that these components, by default, uh, the degree is set to uh, three, so, uh, and, I, and I had to change it to two in order to do this comparison. So, just in case you uh, you have been doing mod um, if you have been doing curve modeling in in Rhino, you will notice that whenever you do a curve or curve surface, usually the default degree for a curve is set to three. Um, why is that? Well, um, now you notice degree one, uh, first degree one is just a straight line, so it's not really a curve. Degree two uh, is actually a curve, uh, and it's relatively smooth, but not as smooth as degree, as, degree, as degree three. So this is a sample we show you what a degree two surface can look like and why it is not as smooth. So this is basically what we call a capsule uh, geometry. You can think of it as a cylinder and then a hemisphere joined right at the two ends. Okay, if you look at the sections, okay, perfect hemisphere and a perfect uh, cylinder. Now, if you look at the the contour uh, or the white line, it, yeah, it's smooth. Uh, here you have a smooth transition, but it's not that smooth in the sense that if you look at the direction that this thing is facing, now the direction of, of a surface is symbolized, is always like indicated by the normal. If you look at normal, this part, um, the normal doesn't change. Okay, so the rate of change of a normal is zero. In the sphere part, the spherical part, the rate of change is non-zero. So it changes by the same amount every time as you walk along the white curve. Okay, but if you look at this transition here, the normal going from no change to to like uh, a constant change immediately, abruptly. There's no transition. Okay. So that's why I mean by it's not smooth enough. So now the uh, normal of the curve are is very important to compute the, re the reflection. So let's say you design a car, and the car kind of reflect the environment. Now the, you know the reflection is heavily influenced by the normal of the surface, right? So right here, what you have is that when you have a car that has this kind of point, and you look at the reflection, you will see that the, it's, it will be uh, discontinuous there and make the car look less attractive. So that's why you need to go to at least one more degree to degree three in order to smooth out the um, the normal variation. In practice, uh, in car design or in um, like furniture design, you go to degree five. It's pretty common to go to five. Okay. So the um, let's say the curve on your iPhone, you may think of it as a rectangle that has a round corner. Uh, but exactly it's not <laughs> because if, if that is the case then you always see it's a discontinuous in this um, um, the reflection, it's not really reflection because the iPhone is not that um, shiny, but it has some like glossy effect around the rim, right? So if it, it is just um, a round corner rectangle, then you will not get that nice little smooth um, highlight effect. This is a render of that same geometry. So if you might, if you look at this transition here, you will see that the reflection changes quite abruptly from from like a spherical to to a cylinder. You can kind of see that, okay? Anyway, um, just we're not going to try this. This is something you can try at home if you want, uh, if, if you're interested. So, if you want to do subdivision but to achieve a degree-free curve, then you have to use something more sophisticated than the one-quarter and three-quarter rule. Okay, so this rule is called the Cat Moon Clack. This is the guy who, uh, one of the founder of Pixar. He was like the pioneer of uh, subdivision curve, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's also the guy who. <laughs> Invent the concept of texture mapping because back at that time, when you render triangles, uh, 3D triangle on the scene, it looks so boring. So this guy thinks that we can slap a texture or like an image on those triangles to make it more attractive. So that was like a long time ago, uh, and he came up. Um, uh, these actually two people, actually uh, not not one, and so these two people uh, proposed this subdivision scheme that basically, in order to generate the next control point, you have to use 
three control points of the current level. So I, I plus one, I plus two, and you combine them using this ratio. Okay, and from this you will get a degree three curve. So if you're interested, you can try this at home. Okay, so similar, it's just like more points, more 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 interpolations. So subdivision curve can be extended to subdivision surface where you can take uh, like a flat polygons, and then you can uh, take the curtain vertex and then compute the next one, and then overall it will be um, it will give you a uh, an increasingly smooth surface. Um, it has been used quite successfully in animations. So Pixar kind of pioneered this technique, and then they use it in their uh, short movie called G Jerry's Game, and it's actually won an Oscar in '96, I think, or 2001. I can't remember. And from that point onward, uh, Pixar kind of switched to use a subdivision curve entirely rather than nerves curve for their movie. So Monster Inc was the first movie, the first full-length movie that used subdivision curve almost entirely for every single character there. Uh, now, of course, when you switch from curve to surface, um, it's way trickier because in curve, when you subdivide a curve segment, you always get two curve segments, so the topology doesn't change. But uh, when you do a surface, there will be some position where a vertex is not shared by four polygons, but being shared by more or fewer than four polygons. And in those cases, the subdivision rule are uh, different, and it will it requires some special treatment. So generally, it's trickier. Anyway, um, lately, um, subdivision surface has also been like slowly moved into uh, architecture engineer because the it has this attractive uh, pro um, uh, appealing property that. <laughs> It's a way to approximate a curve by from from flat panels only. So it's kind of pre pre uh, pre pre rationalized uh, as you go along, rather than so instead of uh, having a nerve a surface and try to like post rationalize it, this is like something you you pre rationalize in advance. Okay, um, so let's take um, what time is it now? Okay, um, let's take a, a 10 minutes break and then we'll, we'll come back. Okay, you want a break or you want to come around? Okay. Okay. All right, hello, welcome back. Uh, so, now um, let's look at, um, so we've been creating variable and we uh, have been saying that uh, each variable can only store data of a certain type, right? Uh, so let's look at that in a bit more details. So when you create a variable A and then you s instead of using a new keyword or create a brand new value to start a variable, but what happens when you say this variable equal to that to another variable? What, what happens behind the scene? So this will, this part will basically explain that. Okay, so what is a variable? So variable, you can think of it as, as it's not actual a value. It it is it's a container. It's something that contains the real value. Okay, so when so we've been doing something like int a equal to twelve. So th this statement has two parts. The first part is create that variable or container, and the second part actually throw a value into that container. Now um, now in the second line we. Cr Create another variable called b, and when we say equal to a, what does this mean? Is that we're gonna take the value in a, and we start in b. This doesn't mean that we take the whole a and start in b. We take the value of a, not not a itself, because a is like a container. It doesn't have a value here. So what we say there is that we extract the value from a and start in b. And now after this line, we change a to seven, okay, and then b will stay twelve, and a will be seven. Okay, so there's nothing like um, unusual there. Now, um, similar example, but for but with point three D. So we create we create um, a point uh, a variable a of type point three D, and we initialize to the actual point whose corner is zero zero zero. Then we create a new variable b, and we say it is equal to a. What does this mean is that we take the content of a and copy it over to b. Okay. This means that after this line, if we change the content of A, for example, we change the Z content of A to 2, then this has no effect on B, okay? Because, well, the content of A is copying 
be, was copied over to B, but like you end up with two separate copies of the data. You have two variables, it holds its own copy, even though initially they share the same data, but like they're two separate copies. They are identical at first, but they're two separate copies. So changing one copy will not affect the other. Okay? So there's nothing surprising there. But things get a bit weird uh, for certain kind of data type. For example, list. Here I have a list of string A. Uh, I initialize to an empty list. I add one element to it. Okay, so so by so at this after this line, A will be a list that store only one element. Hello. And then in the next line, I declare a new list B, and then I say equal to A. Okay, now what happened here? Does the content of a list A copy into B, or does it mean something else, something a little bit more sophisticated? So we will see. Okay, so after we make B equal to A, uh, we modify A by adding a new element to that called goodbye. Okay, so now A will sure have two elements, hello and goodbye. The question is what happened to B? Will B have only one element, hello? Or will it have two elements? So you may have thought that it ha B will have only one element because what happened to A from, from this point onward has no influence on B whatsoever like in these two examples. But it, as a matter of fact it does because it, this data type behaves differently from this data type. Okay, so let's look at it a bit more detail. And this is um, generally for, if, if you're not used to uh, programming or like if you pick up like scripting at first, this can be a bit confusing but it's actually quite crucial. Um, if you don't understand it properly, you might get some very weird or unexpected behavior uh, when you declare and copy variable or assign variable around. Okay, so what is actually stored inside a variable? So as I say, a variable is just a container to store data, but w what is the data? So for, for number, the data is actually just a number. I mean, there's nothing uh, su surprising there. Okay, so the container A store number 12, then we create a new container B. We copy the number 12 over, and we end up with two copy. Changing, changing the first copy has no influence on the second copy whatsoever. Uh, same with point 3D. Okay, so point 3D, just two separate copy. Not nothing surprising there. Totally as we intuitively expected. Okay, so changing the content of the first copy has no inf influence on the second copy. However, for list. And as you see later on, uh, many type in Rhino Common will behave in this way, like mesh curve. They will not when when you say the first curve equal to the second curve, it will not give you two separate copy of the curve. Uh, this is what's gonna happen. Okay, so we create a variable a of type list of string. Okay, now what happened is that the content of the list which is empty for now, it actually will not be stored in A, but it will be stored somewhere else in the memory, okay? So it's stored separately. What is stored in A is a little, think of it as a little arrow or a little address that points A to the actual data, okay? So that might be a bit weird. Why don't we store the list directly in the container, but why we store it somewhere else and then and then just store an address or, or reference to, to, to the actual uh, data? Oh, um, well, the, the answer to that question is quite, um, I mean, a bit complicated, but you can think of the certain kind of data uh, is more efficient if you start separately rather than inside a variable. It's make it easier for the C-sharp language to clean up the memory once it detects that you no longer need it, for example. List usually can store a lot of elements, so it's more efficient to start separately. Integer. Uh, double and some basic data type like point 3D, they are very simple. They have only like a few numbers, so the data can be stored directly inside the container and it's very fast to copy them around. Okay, but for list and curve and mesh, uh, you will see that the data types actually store separately. Now, when you program, you don't actually need to actively mentally think in your head that the data is actually somewhere else. This is just a behind the scenes explanation to explain to you the behavior of of uh, the so-called equal or copying operator, okay? Okay, so that is the list. Now A points to that list. Now, now in the third line, we create a variable B, okay, which is any container, and then we say it's equal to A. So what happened is that the the arrow that points to the list that's stopping A will be copied to B, okay? So now B and A will store the address of the same objects. Okay, which means that whatever you modify 
whatever modification or change that you make to A, that that change will also be visible to B. Okay, because there's only one copy of the data. Okay, so this operator here, the copy is actually doesn't copy the data; it copied the, the reference. And what is the reference? Well, you can think of it just as a little address or an arrow that points to the real data. Okay. Uh, so later on, when you do write a comment, you have a curve, and you copy the curve to another curve variable. You should be aware of now these two variables actually point to the same curve. So if you modify one of them, the other variable will also see the change. Okay. All right. So now if you modify one list by adding the word hello goodbye, the other list will also see the change. Um. <clears throat> All right, so if you want to explicitly make a copy, then you actually have to create a brand new list. So you have to say B equal to new empty list, and then you have to visit each element in A and like copy the string over to the new list. So you have to do what we call a deep copy or like a manual, like deep copy, rather than just copy the arrow. That would take more life code than just saying B equal to A, right? Anyway. So there's basically two kinds of data types. The first is called the value type, where the actual value is stored inside the variable itself. And this applies to many of the default uh, data type in C Sharp, like integer, double. Uh, and many of the uh, lightweight type in the Rhino common, like part three is lightweight. Vector three is lightweight because they essentially just like free numbers uh, for x, y, and z. Uh, circle is also lightweight, line is also lightweight, but light curve and polyline curve are actually um, not value type. So anyway, so for the value type, the, 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 the actual data is stored inside the variable. And whenever you use the copy operator or the equal sign operator, the value will actually be copied and you will end up with two separate copy. Now the second type, the second kind of types is called a reference type where what is stored inside a variable is not the real data, but only the address or a reference to the actual data. Okay, and that applies to the more complex types in the C sharp language, like list, uh, array, um, windows. Uh, if you do a graphical user interface design, okay. Uh, we also in the Rhino common library, uh, the not so lightweight or the more heavyweight type like wrap surface, mesh, and curve. And all of the subtype of curve like polyline curve, uh, nerves curve, so, uh, line curve, or poly curve, uh, they are all reference type, okay? Which means that now, so when you do the copy operator for this uh, kind of a variable, only the reference is copied, not the actual data, okay? Now, uh, this is important to keep in mind uh, when we do functions uh, and list more on list later on, okay? Uh, in Python, it's actually not so different. When you do a list in Python and you uh, say the first list equals to the second list, what happens is that it copies the reference over. So if you modify one of the list, the other list will also see the change. Okay? Maybe, of you, maybe some of you already kind of experienced this uh, unexpectedly when you modify one list and then the other thing keeps jumping around like and you don't know why it behaves that way. Okay, so we move to the next uh, topic, um, functions or methods. Um, now, um, I'm sure that um, all of you here have written a function before, at least in, in Python. In uh, the C-sharp world, there is another synonym for the word uh, function. They call it method. I mean, they have almost exactly the same meaning. So I use these two words interchangeably. So officially, in the C-sharp world, it's called method. But many of us still refer to it as functions. Okay. So what is the function or a method? Uh, well, it is just a way to package the same piece of code so that we can conveniently reuse it many times, but with different inputs. Oh, okay, so it's just a way to parameterize a piece of code, and then we can, so we can reuse it, but on a slightly different input value. Okay, so how we define that? Again, I make a reference back to Python. So. If you want to write a piece of code to compute the volume of the cylinder in Python, so uh, that based on the input uh, radius and height, okay. So that's how you do it in Python. Uh, this is the equivalent in C sharp, okay. So let me explain C sharp. You have to explicitly declare more information. First, um, a function can return a value on nothing. If it returns a value, you have to declare the type of the value it returns. So uh, computer cylinder volume obviously will return a number. So we 
the type of return value is a double, okay, and then the name of the functions, all right, and then bracket, and then the list of the input. Now, it input has to be prefixed by the type of the input. So obviously, uh, we expect a number for the radius and a number for the height, okay, and then the body of the function is enclosed in the curly bracket. Right now here the code, these are the local code that run inside the functions when the function is being triggered. Alright. So the um we compute the base area, we compute the volume, and then we return the volume. Okay, and obviously here the volume is double, which matches the, the type of the return value that we declare here. So um when you um work in a language that asks you to explicitly declare the return type of the functions, uh, even though it puts more responsibility, well, it put more requirement, it asks uh, more, uh, it requires you to like type in more, um, it's, it has advantage of prevent error. So for example, if you return something that's different from double by accident, the code will refuse to run altogether. It detects an error right away. You say that you asked me to return, you declare that you want to return a double, but here you don't return anything, but so function can, can return nothing, in which case you, you admit to return function altogether. Or it can return something that doesn't match the data type. If, if the data type is not matched, uh, then it will throw, throw an error right away. Here, it will happily return anything or not return anything at all. So it relies, it put more responsibility on you as a programmer to make sure that you know what you're doing, okay? All right, so after we have, okay, so where do we write a function in the C sharp script components? Okay, so if you open, so let's, let's um, create a brand new C sharp component. Gonna delete all of this. Okay, this function doesn't have any, doesn't really use any input because we we don't really care about input for now. Let's open the code editor. All right, inside you see the um, run script. Okay. Um, and then here we type a code here. Now, this is another section called custom additional code where we can declare extra stuff. And for now, the first extra stuff that we're going to declare or define is the functions, okay? So, so again, uh, here's your run script function. And then below the run script function, there is uh, some space available for you to declare some custom additional code. So we can define our custom function here. So. We declare a function, we define a function that computes the linear volume, that take in two numbers, okay? Do some math with it, compute a number, and then return that number, okay? Now this is, we define a function, and now we can use this function in the main part of a C-sharp script component, okay? So for example, I can call compute cylinder volume, uh, this should be capital C, I'm, I'm sorry, let me fix it very quickly. Okay, so we, we, we compute, um, we call the compute linear volume, we input in two real value, one and one, okay, and that value one, one will go here, and then we'll, the code will run on those two value, one, one, and, and give us a volume, all right, and the volume will be returned outside, so at the end of the day, the right hand side will execute the code that we define here, and it will give us one single number, one single value that we can store in this temporary variable called volume one. Okay, and then we, well, we just display this temporary variable. Okay, and then we, again, if we run this code, uh, this function again, but on a different input, okay, then we get another number out. We store this number in another temporary variable so we can display it later on. Uh, here it's just me condensing two lab codes into one. Okay, so instead of declaring a temporary variable, well, here you don't really need to because we don't need to reuse this, uh, this variable uh, later on in the code, so we don't need to like declare it. We can only use it in one line. I can even condense, this, condense these three lines into one single statement, for example, well, because this is all you need to know, okay, because this whole thing will evaluate to a number, and that number will be returned, and uh, that's, all, that's all we need, okay?
All right, so let's try this out. All right, so this file function that return a double. Okay, the function is called compute cylinder volume. That take in two number. The first number called R. The second number called H. All right. Inside this function, locally, we will declare. We will have to define some temporary variable just for our intermediate uh, computation step, like the base area equal to math.py. So math is a special library that is available to the C# -sharp language by default. So we just say math dot. Okay. Time r times r times r semicolon. Okay, and then we compute the volume. Okay, and then we return the volume. All right, now we can call the functions, get a value, and print it out. So compute cylinder volume, cylinder. All right, give it some hard call in value. Otherwise, we can always use a value from outside. All right, it is number. We need to convert it to string in order to, to feed it into the print uh, function, the print command. Okay, because we use the print command to display, this means that the result will come out of the out uh, part, not of the A part. Okay. Now, um, you guys got it working? Okay, just to demonstrate my point, uh, what if I return a string? Okay, now if I run this, not, not even run, if I just like attempt to compile this, I will get an error message. It says that, well, I cannot cover the string to a double. I mean, you declare that you want to return a double, and now you actually return a string. So I, C Sharp will try to like um, see if it can cover the string to a double, and by default, there's no such uh, method to do. So it complains an error right away. Okay. Now in Python, you don't declare the return type here. So if you return the string hello, it will happily return it for you, and probably you will not see the error until many lie down later in the code. <laughs> so. It's put more responsibility on you. Uh, more responsibility on you. It's simpler to declare a function in Python, but again, uh, it's um, slightly more. E uh, it's slightly easier to to mess up, and you have to be extra careful and more responsible. Okay. Now the uh, print. I keep saying refer to the print as a command. Well, actually, there's no such thing as command in uh, C sharp programming language. Print is actually a predefined function that actually put appear here. If you expand the member, you see there's something called print, I believe, a uh, utility function. Yeah. So the C sharp component is declare a bunch of like a utility things for you, but it's hidden away. So the content of the print function. I mean, it do a lot of sophisticated thing in just in order to get the string being sent out of the output part, okay? But you don't need to care about the details. You only know that it's already been declared and you can use it for you. Uh, you, you can use it right, right away. 
Anyway, so that's how you write a function that return a value. Now, a function can return nothing in case the return type would be void. Okay, so void is a special keyword that specifies nothing. In that case, the return has to be either nothing, void, or no return at all. Okay, if you return a volume, um, you will get an error message, for example. We we'll say that um, yeah, it say that um, the function uh, computes cylinder volume returns void because that's what you declare, which means that a return keyword uh, must not be followed by anything other than the word void or nothing. Okay, so this will make it happy. Okay, so this error will go away, but you have an error here because you cannot convert a void to a string, okay? But this part is okay. Or maybe if you put in void. Oh, it's not even valid, so okay. So in C sharp, if you don't return nothing, you just say return. Or, or by default, if the code reaches the ends of the body of the function, it will return automatically if you don't explicitly say return, okay? A function doesn't have return anything. For example, a function that takes in a curve and try to move the curve up by one unit, it actually doesn't return anything. It performs an action, but it doesn't return a value. Okay? In some older programming language, like Pascal, they distinguish a function that returns something from a function that does not return anything. So a function that doesn't return anything, they call it a procedure or something. But for uh, Or maybe if you write a function that take in some object and then just use the print command to print out some information of that thing, that one also doesn't return anything because it's just perform the print uh, command, for example. All right, so let's move on. Actually, I don't need to. Right, I can delete that, I guess. All right, so a function and method, uh, in a way, is like a black box because it hides away, it hides all of the details away from the user. So computer learning the volume. Actually, once you define a function, uh, you and your friend, if you share the code to your friend, your friend can use it, uh, only knowing that this function take in two numbers and return the volume. Your friend doesn't even need to know the formula of computing the um, um, the volume of this cylinder. Okay, so it hides the detail from the user. It's a way to like, abstract the code to something more higher level. Okay, and similarly, like the print function that we've been using is actually behind the scene. There are like quite a few number of lines of code in order to send that little piece of text out to the grasshopper canvas. But from our perspective, we only need to say print and fit in a piece of text and nothing else, and it will works. Okay, so now this is um, an, again an important concept related to function that that is not available in Python, but in C sharp it's everywhere. In Rhino Common it's everywhere. And Python, um, you only have half of this concept in Python. I will explain uh, as we go along. Okay, so function overloading. What does it mean? So. What if, again, let's say we want to write a function that computes the cylinder volume, but we have two versions of that. The first a version called Compute Cylinder Volume 1, it takes in two numbers that represent the radius and the height, okay? And from that, it can compute the volume. Now, just for convenience, I want to write um, a second version of the volume, uh, of the Compute Cylinder Volume uh, functions, but this time, instead of taking the height, I take in the point at the bottom, at, at the bottom center of, of the circular face and then the top center, okay? And of course, uh, from those two points, I can like com compute the height uh, inside the function, okay? So bottom center to distant to, so uh, this again, this is a rather common uh, function that compute the distance between two point 3D uh, uh, object. Okay, so it depends on what kind of uh, data available you, you use uh, the uh, write function just for convenience. Okay, so here I have basically the function had a kind of the same meaning, computer in the volume, but because I need to make two separate function, uh, two, two separate versions that take in two separate, uh, two different set of inputs. The first is two numbers, 
The second version take in a number and two point freely. And because of that, I you may think that I have to give this guy a different name because um, what well, these are two separate functions, uh, two different functions. So I have to give it two different names. Uh, however, C sharp allow you to use the same name to represent different flavors of a function. So if you have a function right here, and then later on you declare, you define a function with the same name but with a different input list, C Sharp will allow you to do that. This is something that you cannot do in Python. Because Python, in Python, you do not explicitly declare the type of input. So there's no way Python knows which one you want to use or not. Okay, but in C Sharp, uh, you can. Okay? And if you look at the Rhino common, uh, there's many functions that are being overloaded. Okay? So when you have more than one version of a, of a function, um, we call it function overload or basically you overload the function and this is a very common practice in uh, programming in general all right so um, we are not going to try this out I think it's fairly um, straightforward to understand but like if, if you declare these two functions in the custom additional code um, C sharp will be totally happy and then in the main part of the C sharp component you can't um, you call the compute cylinder volume and then depending on whether you give it two numbers or one number and two property, C sharp will automatically call the right version for you. Okay? So uh, more details behind the scene. Uh, so we know that this kind of concept is called function overloading. Okay? Now um, related to this uh, thing, function overloading, there's something called the function signature. So the signature is basically the one that used to represent the versions uh, of um, of, of the function that has that share the same name. Okay, so what is the signature? Well, the signature is just oh, forget this part. So um, let's try to just demonstrate that you called the function like two different versions of uh, the function. So this one will trigger this version of computer in the uh, volume. This time, uh, this one will trigger the second version because it depends on the input. C sharp will choose the right version for you. Okay, but let's look at behind the scene to see how C sharp can like do it behind the scene, so that when you get an error message, you kind of understand why what caused the error. All right, so behind the scene, this thing called the function function signatures that can be used to uniquely identify the version or the flavor of the uh, of the function that share the same name. Okay, so the function signature is defined by basically the name of the function and the type of the input. Okay, the now the, the name of the variable is irrelevant. You can call it every, anything you want, right? It's, it, it's the types that matter. Now the return type uh, actually doesn't really um, help in uniquely identify which one you want to call. If you think about it, okay. So that's why the signature does not include a return type. You can have one version that returns double and one other version that doesn't return anything. Uh, and it's still a valid C sharp uh, overloading function, even though meaningfully, well, we want to copy volume, so we always want to return a double. But uh, if you want to return void, uh, I still happily. So this is what a signature looks like. This is not C sharp code, by the way. It's just like a way to visualize what a signature. So this is the signature of this function. It's just the name and the type of the input parameters. And this is the signature of the second version of the same function. So again, same name, different. All right, so, which means that if you try to overload function by this, not this time, let's say that I want to overload this function by, okay, having the first version take in two double, R and H, the second version also take in two double, but with like different name. Now this is an invalid overload because now these two guys have the same signature. So if you try to run this code, uh, you will get every message say that, um, Inside the script instance class, um, well, we have not talked about class yet. But when basically when you type in the code, um, your code lives inside this class uh, called script instance. And basically, it's the error message say that uh, inside the script instance, there's already um, a, a functions that call compute cylinder volume and takes in a double and a double. So you see, the name has no effect on the signature. So uh, when you define um, two functions that had the same list uh, of inputs and then when you call it in the call C sharp we never know which one you want to to call that's why this allows this thing okay uh, same 
so this time, uh, even as I said earlier, the void of the return type is not part of the signature. So these are these two function has like uh, may looks different, but they have the same signature. So they will be invalid uh, when you define them together because when you call compute cylinder volume and give it two numbers again C# -sharp doesn't know which one you want to use so it will disallow this uh, definition as well okay now if you have two uh, okay so these are the two valid um, um, versions of compute cylinder volume and when you use it and then let's say you try to um, use one of the version but you the input list does not match any of this uh, predefined uh, version, then you will get an error message say that no overloaded method for compute cylinder volume that takes zero argument, for example, because well you haven't defined any that takes in zero argument. Or sometime if you try to fit in a number and a point, it will try to find the best match, and it will say the best overload method match. Basically, the, the closest one it can find is double double. Okay, so if you see this error message, you basically just check your input, essentially. Okay. Now, Python, obviously, you can't uh, overload function definition. However, you can use function that have already been overloaded for you because those functions were defined using C sharp. So when you access a Rhino common library from Python and you call it to the Rhino common uh, functions, you will see that those Rhino common functions was actually originally defined C sharp and they have overload version. So that's why from Python you can call those overload version happily, but you cannot define new overload version uh, yourself in Python. Okay, so that is the special features of the Python that you are using in 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 Rhino and Grasshopper. Okay, so the next thing related to functions, uh, this is uh, we can try it out. So, what happened when we pass? Um, so a function taking some input parameters, right? So what happened when we send inputs into um, the parameters? So let's see. Okay, here I have a fake function. So the function does some very silly thing. You don't really care why it, it wants to do this. Uh, the name. In programming, when you want to like name something where the name is not relevant, but you have to write it, you just call it foo. So, okay, a function that's taking a number and try to modify this number by add one to it. Okay, so internally it modified the input parameter, but let's see what happened. Okay, so this is we define a function, and here we use this function. Okay, so let's say we define variable called my number called 2.0, and then we pass this number into the full function okay so at this line if you print out my number it's gonna be 2.0 sure now after this line after my number goes into the full function and the full add one to it if you print out my number here will you get the old value of my number or you get a modified value okay you get two okay you want to try it out are you confident that it will be two <laughs> <laughs> Because you don't have to return to the return you know, that okay. thing and it's void. Okay, but it modify my number. Okay, so it's say my number equal. It doesn't say return some number bus one. It's actually, it add one and then it say equal to. So it's reassigned to to the variable. So it might give you the impression. Okay, so when your answer is correct, it will give two. But the reason is not because it doesn't use a return statement, but because the way that that, that the data is sent into the uh, the function. So when you say foo my number, what really happened is that it doesn't send the variable my number into foo. It send the value that my number store into this guy. So basically, it's copied the value 2.0 and send it to here. So whatever happened inside this function will be we only affect the local copy. The original copy, aka my number, is still unaffected. Okay. So when you again. When you call a function, you pass in some parameter, the value of those parameter will be copied into the functions. Okay, and what hap what happens to those parameters internally inside the function will not affect the original parameters. Okay. Most of the time. <laughs> okay, you will see some exceptions soon, and this important it's important to uh, to aware of this because again, otherwise you will you might run into some very weird error when you try to pass 
a curve into a function, you modify it. Surprisingly, you will see that that modification will have influence to the original curve. So, <coughs> so let's see. <coughs> All right, let, let's move on from now. Okay, we don't have to try it out because you already got a correct answer. <laughs> okay, so this tech, so this mechanism is called pass by value, aka the value of the parameter is copied into the uh, functions, and then the function will act on that local copy of the value. Okay. All right, so we know that that's nothing new. All right, but this is the weird thing. But remember, there is two data types, the value type and reference type. Okay, so if I pass in a list of string, okay, now remember the, the variable that's stored inside the text here is actually not really the list of string, but a reference to the list of string. So when I pass that reference or the address in, I still actually have access to the original data, not the copy of the data, like in the case where I pass a number. Which means that here, if I modify text, actually the original list will be influenced. Okay, so let's okay let's define my text, which is empty for now. So if you print the count of my text, it will be zero for sure. And then if you pass my text in, now what happened is that it will copy the address of my text into this guy. But when you copy the address and then you use the same address, look into the data, you end up with the same list anyway. So when you try to modify the list inside, you actually point to the same data, and you modify the very same data. So after this line, when you print my text, you print out the number of elements in my text, you will see that it has been changed to one. So whatever modification happens inside the function actually influence the original variable. Hmm. So for we have two type of data, value type and reference type. For the value type, when you copy the data in, the mod um, and then you modify the value internally, uh, it will not affect the original variable. But for reference type variable, which is list, curve, mesh, it will send in the reference to the original variable. So what happened to inside the function will affect the original copy. Okay, and that's important to keep in mind because when you send in a curve and then internally you modify the curve uh, and then the function finish and then you get back to the main chord, the curve will change, the original curve will, will change. If you want it to not be changed, you have to duplicate the curve into a new curve and send that duplicate curve into the function. That's how you can preserve the original copy. Okay? So uh, you can construct a new curve using the same data. Or uh, many of the data type inside Rhino Common like Curve MS it has this called duplicate function. Basically, internally it, it duplicates everything for you. But um, we're gonna have some example of that uh, on the second and the third day of the workshop. Okay. So for number, uh, for example, whenever you send in, it's automatically copy because number is so lightweight. Um, it will copy by default. But imagine you have a list of like million points and whenever you call the functions on the list, if it really copy the whole list in, it will take a lot of time. Okay, that's why it doesn't do the, the copying of the whole list. It actually copy just the address, send in the address, because the address is very lightweight. But now you have you have to separate a copy of the address, but it, it's, they are the same address, they point to the same object. Remember the little arrow that I showed you before? They are two separate arrows, but they point to the same thing. So if this guy modify the original value, the the, uh, the other guy will see the influence, okay? So this, uh, many of the data types that we'll be working inside Grasshopper, like curve and mesh, um, they will be uh, behave in this way, okay? All right, so that is just um, uh, re recall to the uh, two data types before. All right, so we know now um, so still um, um, related to the theme of like passing parameter into a functions. We know that for, uh, for the value type uh, variable, like a number, for example, the value will be copied in. Okay, so whatever happened inside will not influence the original variable. Okay, so if we pass my number in, uh, whatever foo does to my number is totally internal and local. It has no influence. However, there are cases where we do intentionally want it to influence the original variable. Um, 
for example, uh, we have a number and then we send it in and we want to um, divide it by two. And uh, what you can do is as creating a brand new value divided by two and return the new value outside. But there, there are cases where you actually want to modify the same parameter that you pass in. Let's say that you want to do it. Um, that, I will show you a good example, like why is it useful later on for now. Let's say that we want to do it, okay? So how do we do it? So that method is called pass by reference. All you need to do is when you define the parameters, you put in a ref keyword, okay? And then when you actually call the, the foo, you have to also say ref. Now this thing, it will actually ask, pass in not a number two, but it pass in the whole variable. Okay, so whatever you mo what whatever modification that you make to my number internally will influence the original variable my number. Okay, so at this time after this point, if you print out my number, it's gonna be free. Okay. All right, uh, it's been a bit uh, confusing. So any question before I move on? Okay. Now in Python, it's almost like it's almost like that as well. So if you pass in a curve into a Python function and you modify it internally, the original curve will be affected. Same with list, but not with number or piece of text. <laughs> okay. So let me show you a good example when the ref keyword is actually useful. Okay. So so when we actually want to modify the original uh, number or input parameters. Uh, let's let let let's ignore this one. I put it in just in case you ask some question, but it just add to the confusion. So let's skip that. <laughs> let's say you want to write a function that compute both the area and the volume. Okay. Now previously, when we compute only the area, we can return the result using the return keyword, right? Now we have two value to return. Now in Python, when you want to return multiple value, you can package these uh, multiple values in a tuple, right? And then um, it, then you are responsible to unpack the tuples into multiple value if you want to use it. Now in C sharp, uh, you can also define a tuple. However, tuple in um, C sharp is a bit cumbersome, and normally the way to do that is not using tuple but using the ref parameter. Okay, so we compute the area and volume of a sphere. So the first input parameter is the R that tell tell you the radius of the sphere. However, you also pass into these these two parameters as a reference variable. Now the purpose of these two parameters is not to specify the input data but to hold the output result. Okay? So you compute the area, then you start it in this parameter because we pass it in the ref, so whatever you start it will affect the original parameter. Okay? Same with volume. Okay, and now you can like so this is how you return you, you can communicate multiple results of your computation to to the outside code. Okay? So this is how you use it. You create a variable, you initialize to zero, you create another variable to store the volume, you initialize to zero, and then you pass it in. Now this function will compute it and then read we compute the volume internally and store the volume in this parameter, and then store the area, uh, store the area in this parameter, and the volume in this parameter. So after this line, you can get the area result, and then area result will go from zero to whatever the real area of the sphere is. Okay, so so the ref keyword can be used to as a way to communicate multiple results of the function to the outsiders. Okay. Sometimes you so this is one case where you want to use this star result. There's, there are other cases where you actually just want to modify. So let's say if you have a pawn freely, a pawn freely is, um, is a value type, so it will be passed in using the copy mechanism. So whatever you modify internally to the pawn will not influence the original one. But let's say if you want to pass in a pawn and you want to like zero the, the x components, okay? Uh, so one way to do it is that you can pass it in as a ref. Uh, parameter so you can modify it internally. Okay, if you don't use a ref, well, you can always create a brand new point and then return it, and then you end up with two copy, one original and one modified one. That will also work. Okay, but a ref keyword provides us another way to modify the original points. Okay. Now, when you use the ref keyword uh, to store the result uh, of uh, your internal computations.
You notice that when you want to use uh, the red keyword in this way, um, you basically the pattern is that you have to declare some temporary variable to hold the result. Okay, so you you declare this one, then you send it in the function. Now the annoying bit is that when you declare this guy, you also have to initialize to some default value. If you don't initialize it and then you pass it in, it will say that every result has not been initialized. So whenever you create a variable, you have to initialize at least once before you you can use it in a function or anything else. But it's kind of annoying because I don't want to initialize it here. I only want to declare in order to have some variable to store the result. Uh, it is the responsible or uh, the responsibility of this function to actually compute the value and start here. Uh, I don't want to actually have to like uh, initialize to 0.0. .0. It, it's not it's not a bad, but it's kind of annoying and seem seem to be redundant. So that is why in C sharp they provide another special version of the ref keyword. It's called the out keyword. That is just for the purpose of outputting parameters. So when you replace the ref with the out keyword. And you will see that many rather common functions use this out keyword. Okay, so when the out keywords behave exactly the same as a ref keyword, it will affect the original um, uh, variable. But it's the only difference is that when you send in the variable, you don't have to initialize it. Okay, so it's less annoying. Okay. All right. So in rather common, there is one good example with the out keyword, and we're gonna do some live example right now. So an example of out parameter from Rhino Common. So in Rhino Common, if you look at uh, the curve class, okay. So let's say that we have uh, a curve object. So a cup, an object of type curve. We start in a variable called my curve. Okay. So my curve is a variable uh, of type curve, capital C. Okay. Now inside my curve, uh, so so my curve. Um, so variable of type curve has this special functions called closest point. So the, the closest point will take in some point 3D. Now let's say that we start in this variable here. And then it will try to compute uh, the curve parameter that, re that corresponds to the closest point to my point. OK, you understand that? So the closest point does not give you the closest point right away. It just gives you the parameter of the closest point. OK? Now, Weirdly, uh, the closest point function does not return the parameter as a return value. It's actually return it via the out parameter because it reserves the main return uh, slot for the special Boolean value to signify to us, the user of the closest point function, whether it has been successful in finding the closest point, because not every time the closest point runs, it can give you something. Um, uh, it, it, it will give you a valid closest point. So it reserves the main return value uh, to signify to you that, and because there's only one slot for return, it has to use the out parameter to start the actual result. So it seems a bit clumsy, but this is a pretty standard way in C sharp when you want to return multiple value. Okay. So. Just to make it clear, write a comment could have been designed to work like this. So the closest pawn can like take in one pawn and return the t value of the closest pawn right away. And then you can use this t value to actually get a pawn for d. It's fine. But as I say, because um, because of the nature of the math of finding the closest pawn sometime, um, it's impossible to find the closest point. So that's why the main return types will, instead of return you a t value, it's return you a Boolean value that tell you whether uh, there exists um, a closest point or not. So if it's returned true, then you can safely go ahead and use the t-value here to compute the closest point. If it's returned false, uh, then you can do something different. You can throw an error message to the user or handle this code differently. Okay, but most of the time it will return true, and you can safely read out the t-value here and use it to evaluate. The closest point on the curve. Okay, so we're gonna have a, a live example using this function soon. Okay, uh, any question about that? Any question about the out keyword? Okay. 
All right, so uh, we're going to use the closest product function for this example where we want to sub adaptively subdivide in curve. So we do subdivision curve uh, in the previous live example. This one is slightly different. This one, we actually start with a fully defined curve, a nerve curve, and we want to subdivide it into line segments, okay? In the previous example, we start from line segment and we get to eventually get to a, a curve. But here we start with a, a fully defined curve and then we break it into segments until it is uh, sufficiently subdivided. Okay, so uh, we're gonna use a recursive uh, function to subdivide this curve. So let's say the input now is a little curve. Okay, and this is how it works. We start with the start, the, the default start point and the default end points of uh, the curve. And basically we just draw a strange slide to, um, to these two points. And we call this an approximation of the white curve. But we should test whether this approximation is good enough by measure the, dif the distance between the midpoints of our approximated version of the curve and the actual curve, okay? So we take the midpoint and compute uh, the closest point and compute the distance. If it is further or larger than a threshold, then we cut the curve into two half, okay? And then we have a new approximation. And again, we take the midpoint and try to see if it's sufficiently close to the white, to the real curve. Okay. If not, then we keep subdividing it. Okay. Until we uh, get sufficiently close to the real curve. So this algorithm is actually it was invented, um, also quite a bit ago by this French guy. Back at that time, a uh, computer can only draw lines. So when you have, <laughs> A curve, even though you have the equation of the curve, when you actually want to display it on the screen, you have to like break it into a bunch of lines because the um, the method to to actually turn on the pixel on the screen at that time can only handle lines, but not curve. Okay, so but uh, we can also use the same method to like let's say break any surface adaptively and recursively into a bunch of line segments. Okay, so here uh, we're gonna use a recursive uh, algorithm to do so. Uh, so a recursive uh, function is a function that calls itself multiple times. Okay. All right. So let's get back to C sharp. All right, let's create a brand new C-sharp component. The first input is going to be a uh, curve. Lowercase c. All right, so variable names always start with, low, uh, with lowercase letter. All right, the type of this input is curve. So let's go to type in and we're going to choose the curve. Uh, and curve is a type uh, already predefined by in the Rhino Common Library. It is not a default C sharp type. So curve right here. All right. The next one is tolerance. It it will uh, tell us. Uh, how close we must come close to the original curve before we stop the subdivision. So tolerance, and this is a double, a number. Okay, and A will just read the output part, so we just leave it as a default name. All right, now let's draw a curve in Rhino and refer it to Grasshopper. Mm. 
for the tolerance we should set it uh, I make a slider but make sure the slider will never go to something to anything smaller than 0 0.1 if you set it to 0 the algorithm will, will run forever because you will never be able to subdivide close enough to the curve so your code the code will run forever and you have to force close right now so let's safeguard it by limit the slider to 0 0.1 All right, so we can start with the code now. So again, let me walk you through the code first, and then we can type it in. All right, so now before we type in the main code, we need to define the recursive function that divide the curve and decide whether it should keep dividing, keep dividing it on the left part of the curve, the left half part of the curve, and the second half part of the curve. So the function is called divide curve. Okay, this function doesn't return anything. Uh, that's why is the return type is a void. Okay. Now function name should be capital. So here I, as my bad, I'm, I'm used lowercase, but it should be uh, uppercase. Okay, so divide curve. Okay, this function take in the curve, like the, uh, the master curve, the big curve that we are trying to process. The, the current starting position of the segment that we're looking at, okay, and the, the, the t value or the parameter value of the end of the segment we're looking at. So at the beginning, we're going to call this function on 0, 0.0 to 1.0, okay, because we want to fully cover the whole curve. Uh, well, we assume that the curve is already reparameterized, so the curve parameter runs from 0, 0 0.0 to 1.0, uh, which means that, um, I'm sorry, we should go back to Rhino and reparameterize the curve, okay? We can reparameterize using C sharp code, but, well, just keep, keep it simple, we're gonna reparameterize it uh, in Grasshopper before we fit it in the C sharp component. Okay. All right, now let's get back to the code. All right, so from the um, start, from the t value of the start, uh, we can obtain the actual point uh, at, at the start position. So curve dot point at, and then we fit it the, the, um, the, the t start parameter. Okay, so if you look at the Rhino Comma library, which I will do it with you uh, later on, uh, I'm gonna like um, navigate through the Rhino Comma library after we learn a little bit about class and object oriented programming. So the curve, so any variable of type curve, uh, it comes with some like predefined function for that particular da uh, data type. So curve has this function called point at, and point at will take in a curve parameter and return the point 3D value, okay? at that position. Okay, so that's how we compute the starting point of the segment we are looking at. Uh, then again we do for the end points. Now we want to compute the middle point of the line segment that of the strange line that go directly from the starting point to the end point. Okay? So middle point will be well 0 0.5 times start point plus end point. Okay. Now we need to find the closest point of the middle point on the curve so that we can measure the, the distance between this guy and if the distance is larger than our tolerance here we're gonna subdivide the curve into two parts and then keep drawing segment between them okay so now find the, the, the closest value so we we declare a variable of type double the star that will be used to store the parameter of the closest point okay so t closest we don't need to initialize it because we're gonna send it into the out parameter part of the closest point function. Okay, so curve dot closest point. Uh, so on any object of type curve has the closest point function that's taking the point 3D and then the second parameter, an out parameter that is used to hold the the result. Okay. 
Okay, so after this function finish, t closest will store the value of the closest point to the middle point. Okay. And here I do actually two things at once. So first I use the t closest to evaluate the actual closest point on the curve. Okay, so curve dot point at and then I fit in the t closest. Okay, so this whole expression here will give me a point 3D. Okay. This whole thing will give me a point for and well point for any point for it has a dot distance to functions that take in another point and returned a distance between those two points. Okay, so the whole big thing will give me a number, which is the distance between the closest point and the middle point, and I start in the distance variable. Okay, and then I have to compare the distance to the tolerance. If the distance is less than the tolerance, then I can stop. I can actually draw the actual lines here. And add it, to, add that lines into the list of line segment. Okay, so um, the list of line segment is something that I pass into the function. Initially, it will be empty, but as we, the, the, the divide curve function is applied multiple times, uh, new line segment will be add will be added to this list of segments. Okay, so if the distance is smaller than the tolerance, I can create a line curve. So I create a line curve object from the start point and the end point. Okay. And then I add that directly to the list of points. Okay, so these are basically two statements that I condense into into one statement. Okay, the first part actually create the light curve, which so this whole expression will give me a light curve object. Okay, and then I add that to to the list segments. Okay. Now if not, now if the distance is still not smaller than tolerance, then I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm gonna call the, the divide curve. So I call it. I call the very same function that I'm trying to define here. Okay, but this time I'm gonna supply a slide with slightly different input. Okay, so I have to compute the middle value, the t middle, which is just halfway between the t star and the t n. Okay, and then I'm gonna run the exact same functions. Uh, this should be capital D. I'm sorry. Let me fix that quickly. Okay, call divide curve. I put it. I give it the same curve. Uh, the same st value for the t star, but this time I only want to run this until t middle. Okay, same tolerance and the same list of segments. Okay, so we use the same list of segments, but we pass it through, and then new line segment will be keep adding to this list. So it's the same list. Okay, and then uh, that is the left half part of the curve from start to t middle, t star to t middle, and then we have to do the same procedure again for the second part. Okay. All right, so that is the recursive function. Uh, we need to call this recursive function at the upper level, the master level, once between the 0.0, .0 parameter and the 1.0. That is how we trigger the whole chain of recursive call. Okay. So after we define this function, we can go in the main part of the code. Okay. So here in the custom additional code, we define the divide curve function as we did in the previous slide. And inside the run script, we can just first let's create an empty list of uh, segments. Okay. And then we can Call the divide curve once at the master at like the highest level. Fit in the curve. We fit in the like the parameter of like the largest segment, 0, 0.0 to 1.0. The tolerance came from the, uh, the, the tolerance come from outside uh, from the grasshopper canvas, and then the list of segments. Okay, so divide curve will run, and it will call divide curve multiple time internally uh, if it's deemed necessary until the tolerance is met. All right, and after that. After divide curve runs recursively, we can just send the uh, list of segments to um, the output part A. I think in, in our uh, the question about canvas, the output is called A now, but in the script it's called output segment, so here it should be A. Let me fix that. A, A, what is it? So nothing called A, and then A, what is it? Okay. So let's do this. All right. So I'm just gonna copy it here, the um, recursive function, and I. All right, and I can run it once. So list of like curve. Segments. 
equal to new list apply curve. So we create a new empty list apply curve. Alright, and when we call the divide curve, the first recursive call, put in the curve, tolerance, segments, uh, 0 0.0, 1.0, tolerance, All right, let's test it. So when the tolerance is very high, uh, I basically get a very a strange line. But if I reduce the tolerance slowly, I should get more and more like segment. Oh, 0 0.1 is still like a big jump. Let me reduce it even more. Okay, do not reduce the tolerance to zero because uh, the recursive call will be like run infinitely because <laughs> I mean the distance will never reach a zero. Okay. All right, everybody, I think uh, it's time to break for lunch now. We'll continue at 2.30. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to Mensa, I guess. <laughs> for the people who are watching the live stream, Mensa is a German word for cafeteria. <laughs> it's not of the organization for the people with highest IQ like in America.